One. Now we are. Now we're rolling. All right. Well, I got seven. So I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, before we get started, a couple of ground rules. First thing, silence your cell phones, please. Um, there will be a time for public comment at the end of presentation of plan and also at the uh, end of the meeting after new business. Please identify yourself. Uh, use the raise your hand icon on the uh, on your screen or send Greg an email and wait to be identified. When you are identified, please identify yourself, name and address. Um, aside from that, you guys, most of you have been here before, know how it works. So let's keep on moving. Um, let me uh, start with the approval of the minutes from our May meeting. Anyone have any uh, discussion on that? Any changes? Chris, did you want to do a roll call? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot my roll call. Yeah. All right. Roll call. Uh, Alex, here. here. <laughs> Alex. Here. Tim. Here. John. Here. Andy. Here. And Tony. Present. Did I miss anybody? Uh, for the record, make sure uh, you make sure that uh, Hal and David are included in the minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so David Collingwood is here, Hal Schirmer is here, both supervisors. Uh, right. Who do we have here uh, with Veris? Uh, Ryan Hahn with Veris Partners, Bob McCormick with Veris Partners, and Elkie Weatherall with Veris Bar Partners. Okay. Anyone else want to identify themselves for the record? If not, we will move on to the minutes. Um, so again, uh, May 10th minutes from our last meeting. Any any corrections? Excuse me, uh, excuse me, couldn't find the mic. John Snyder from Saul Ewing for Veris. Who are you with? I'm sorry. Uh, Saul Ewing, law firm Saul Ewing. Um, okay. Uh, here with Veris. Okay, thank you. And additionally, I'm Adam Citruma with Bowler Engineering. Okay. Anyone else? All right. I think we got it covered. We're gonna try again. Try again with the minutes. Uh, any discussion on the minutes from our last meeting? I have none. I have none. I have none. No. All right. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? This is Alex. I so motion. Andy second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move right into uh, Virus. Uh, someone from your team want to take control here? Uh, this is Ryan Hahn with uh, Virus Partners. Am I able to share my screen here? Sure. So One through. second. Okay. There you go. And you're able to share it now. Okay. As I mentioned, I'm uh, Ryan Hahn with Veris Partners. My office is at 3209 West Smith Valley Road, Greenwood, Indiana, 46142. Uh, with me this evening, uh, Bob McCormick and Elkins Weatherall, also with Veris Partners, Adam Citrullo with Bowler Engineering, and John Schneider uh, representing us from Sal Ewing. So uh, this is a pro project that was before you at the February Plan Commission meeting. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of what we're proposing here um, and then some updates. Uh, we've gone through several iterations of comment and review since the last time we presented, so I wanted to highlight a few of the details. Um, so the property location, you may be familiar with this, is the redevelopment of the former drum construction site at the southwest corner of Clymer and Meeting House Road. Um, it's approximately 17 acres. Um, our intention here, and we've provided even further details regarding the elevations, rendering, cross-section of the building uh, for a what I'd call a Class A institutional quality um, industrial uh, warehouse building. Um, so this rendering provides uh, a level of, of what we're proposing here. This is hard wall construction, uh, prominent entr entrance features, and professional landscaping. Um, and I can provide this exhibit as well. Just um, these always don't come out clear on the computer renderings, but uh, this is actually a project that we completed recently. This is in my home city. Uh, this is 
I don't know if it's fair to call it a color scheme. It's all gray, but um, just gives a little bit better presentation of, of uh, you know, what we're committed to doing in terms of a finished quality uh, project here. Um, so I wanted to back up. Uh, there were some items provided to the plan commission following our, our initial presentation um, as to where the starting point was. Um, I think you're aware since our involvement in the property, uh, we've conducted our own due diligence and we've started a remediation effort on that site that included removal of surface and subsurface debris on the property, uh, closing of the existing well on the site. Um, and then our intention going forward is obviously to remove any remaining vehicles, uh, debris on the property. Uh, we did outline there's an existing septic system behind this uh, uh, metal building on the site, which will also be raised and the septic removed. And then the existing access to this property is from Climber Avenue, uh, where the vehicles from this uh, from the contractor site uh, go to now. That's going to be removed um, for more direct access. Um, so a few items um, we've updated since our last uh, presentation and response to the uh, review. I guess I'll start off on a high level on the traffic improvements. Um, so we are we did conclude in our proposal. This is a substantial improvement to. Uh, I, I guess I'll start in the counterclockwise along Climber Avenue. Uh, we've removed the access point from Climber Avenue. There are three existing culverts underneath that roadway that are being removed and replaced. And then we're also uh, regrading the drainage along that roadside swale. Along Meeting House Road, uh, we're widening and resurfacing almost the entire length of it, uh, less the small portion just south of our site that was improved, but that's almost 1,700 feet of Meeting House Road uh, that's being improved with this project, uh, uh, the widening and resurfacing. Uh, one of the, uh, the traffic comments we received following our first meeting uh, was further required further analysis of the intersection of Meeting House Road and State Road 152. Uh, so we did perform that analysis. Um, the first, we performed the signal warrant analysis, uh, including uh, future projected volumes. Uh, this did not trigger a, a traffic signal requirement at that intersection. Uh, but then we also performed a analysis for a right turn lane warrant, uh, which did trigger the right turn lane warrant. Uh, so we have included uh, installation and uh, design and construction of a 300 foot right hand turn lane. Uh, coming from westbound State Road 152 to northbound Meeting House. Uh, this also has the ancillary benefit in addition to our widening of uh, widening the throat of that intersection and allowing for uh, better maneuvering for vehicles in and out of that in and out of that intersection. Um, I know we've heard uh, concerns regarding stormwater management from this property and they've been heard. Um, I'm going to let Adam uh, from Bowler speak to the technical specifics, um, but just at a high level, the site right now drains uh, roughly 50-50 to the north and to the south. Uh, the design of our stormwater management system, and this is from uh, external review, uh, the runoff volumes are going to be reduced to the north by over 80% and over 50% to the south volumes. And I'll let Adam speak to the uh, the redundancy that's built into that system and the operation of that system as I know there's some specific specific concerns regarding that. Um, also during our last meeting we discussed um, buffering on the this property from adjacent properties. Um, since that last time we've made some significant updates to the landscape plan so this includes uh, canopy and evergreen plantings along the length of Climber Avenue. Uh, we've also added, there was a suggestion on adding additional plantings along our entrance driveways or for shading of our driveways and our stormwater management basins. Um, so that was included on this updated plan. Uh, buffering of the residential uses along Meeting House Road. Uh, we did extend the length. Uh, we have a, a grade differential. Our parking lot is actually lower than these properties to the north along a majority of it. Uh, but we did extend the length of the berm along that property in addition to increasing the solid uh, fencing height uh, up to eight feet and then also adding a significant amount of it, additional landscaping. Um, on lighting, um, our original proposal included uh, lights with full, uh, full horizontal cutoff uh, features on those lenses to uh, reduce any light spillover to neighboring properties. Um, but one thing that you'll see added in this update 
is we've also added shields to all those fixtures around the perimeter of the property to uh, reduce any nuisance um, glare from those fixtures as well. Uh, there was a comment, and this was uh, an, a good audience comment as well, was uh, regarding consideration for a white reflective or green roof on this building. Uh, we actually did update, although you don't see it in your submittal, uh, what was originally designed as a black EPDM roof. Uh, this is being specified as a white uh, TPO membrane or reflective uh, roof membrane in response to those comments. So I know in our um, first meeting, we went through the uh, individual waivers on this and uh, comments. Um, I would highlight that there's the only change to the waivers, we've eliminated a waiver. Uh, there was concern we were looking for a smaller parking spot size. Uh, this revised plan we are showing, uh, I believe we reduced one parking stall, but the parking stalls are compliant, so that waiver has been removed as well. Um, we're prepared to go through any specific comments or concerns. I wasn't going to go through or have Adam go through any, uh, you know, these one by one. But uh, with that, um, I appreciate again your review, and we'll uh, we'll address any comments or questions you have. All right. Um, we, we are creatures of habit, and we <laughs> we typically run down the review letter because, you know, your your comments that you gave us are are scattered throughout this review letter. But we weren't, you know, it's difficult to follow you through the letter to make sure we're hitting every point. Um, so if you don't mind, we'll just run down it. If there will complies, uh, just move, just keep moving. Fair enough. Sure. Yeah. So I just want to jump in <clears throat> at this point <clears throat> to review the review letter dated June 8th. Um, just to reiterate, we've gone through, I think this is the third review letter now <clears throat> at this point or the, whatever drink, that we've received from Wynn. So I can go through it one at a time and indicate if it's will comply or not. I can read through the whole comment if you would like. If it's a will comply, you don't have to read the comment. Just tell us that number and it's a will comply and keep things moving. That sounds great to me. So in regards to comment one, and to be clear, I'm referring to the land development plan review letter, not the engineering and drafting review letter, just so we're on the same page. Um, going through that review letter, comment one is ultimately no real uh, response necessary, um, just a statement. Uh, comment two is also a statement. There's no real response necessary in there. And uh, comment three is uh, also, let's call it a statement uh, with the township or opinion that the township should determine if the proposed buffer is satisfactory as it relates to the buffer that Ryan had prior uh, spoken about. I would like to save comment on that uh, for later because I intend to, uh, that comment's essentially repeated a few times throughout the review letter. So when we get to that comment, I would like to uh, further elaborate on that if you don't mind. No um, problem. Perfect. Next comment, comment four, uh, is uh, essentially uh, no response really necessary um, at that point. It is simply a statement. Um, comment five, uh, Ryan had gone through uh, some of the uh, building um, cross sectional detail and uh, photos in that regard. So I think that one's ultimately a statement unless anyone has any comments on the renderings that Ryan had uh, reviewed with us. Uh, comment six is the waivers. I would actually like to um, address those perhaps towards the end because a lot of these comments um, reflect these waivers. So if it's uh, everyone's preference, I like to go through uh, several of the comments and revisit if there's any comments on the waiver. All right, yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Adam, could I interrupt you a second? I had my, I had my mic off. Sure. Uh, can we go back to, to number five? The one, the one question that is in there uh, was the question of whether there was any proposed um, equipment to be mounted on the roof of the building. So, we have sections, but we, we asked that question. So, um, Steve, this hasn't been designed yet, but just in response to that question, 
Uh, we anticipate that we'll need uh, four uh, industrial heating units on this building on the day it's constructed. Um, you know, there will perhaps be some uh, future office build out that will require HVAC units along the front of the building. Uh, the bottom line in that there, we're not asking for a change to the ordinance as it's written. Um, obviously, that design will comply with the building height limitations. Um, but that's that's further description of what we'll be installing day one. And I can provide some example cut sheets if needed. Okay, just trying to get a general idea of, you know, what additional might be there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so that was comment five, as I noted, comment six are the waivers, and we can kind of revisit those um, after we go through the rest of the review letter. Uh, comment seven is in regards to the traffic impact study, and I think there's uh, several different comments that also relate to that in regards to this review letter, um, in regards to any sort of discussion. Obviously, we're also in receipt of the McMahon review letter as well, which speaks to it, so ultimately would be my preference. Um, as we get through this review letter, we're likely addressing um, a couple of concerns in that regard and can either revisit it if there's any additional questions from um, our continued explanation. And I, I guess I'll just add to that that Rob Hoffman, our traffic engineer, was not able to attend tonight. Um, he will be reviewing and responding uh, to the comments I uh, received from the McMahon letter on, on June 8th here. June 9th, sorry. So there's no response from uh, PennDOT as of yet? Uh, no, there's not. And, and frankly, I mean, we've we've done the signal warrant analysis and the, uh, the right turn lane warrant analysis for both of those. Um, we did include in our traffic study, I know that there's, it looks like in our second review letter, there was two potential projects. Um, there's a, uh, uh, looks like a third potential project that's been added um, on this latest uh, traffic review letter uh, that's come to the township. Uh, we do have a future growth projection in those studies. Um, and so I guess we, we need to have a discussion on kind of where that where that goes in terms of uh, what your what your ask is from us for those for those other traffic volumes. Um, we are pro proposing the improvements to accommodate our traffic volumes. And you had said that this did not warrant a, a signal based on your traffic study. This is Tim speaking. Correct. Uh, TPD performed both the, um, and, and I can have them follow up with a formal response to that, performed both a traffic signal warrant analysis uh, with our existing uh, traffic projections and then the right turn lane warrant analysis, and it did not trigger the signal. Okay. Tim, I think to follow up what you might be thinking, uh, I believe that that study was probably based on Barris's additional traffic with the background growth and not necessarily the additional traffic that'll be added by those other projects. Yeah, understood. I was just uh, surprised that even the traffic generated by Barris wouldn't trigger a signal at that intersection. That intersection is terrible. <clears throat> intersection is terrible now. You can't get out of there most times. Yeah, Do you know I what the speed limit there. is along there? What's that, John? Do you know what the speed limit is along there? I'm I'm just thinking, you know, a tractor trailer making a left-hand turn out of that facility crossing State Road is going to take seconds. And if you've got traffic going 40, 45, 50 miles an hour down that road, um, it's at least 45. It's 40. Uh, this is Tony. It's 45 on state, uh, 35 on meeting house. Believe it or not. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking of a of a truck turning, coming out of the facility and then turning from meeting house on the state road heading towards 309. You know, you're not only crossing one lane of traffic, but you've got potentially traffic coming up behind the truck right yeah that that intersection's a mess i can't imagine this wouldn't trigger a signal there i agree i guess in terms of the response there um we're not uh taking objection to it um we're we're uh, submitting this to out for uh concurrence on the improvements 
and you know we'll comply with that and i believe there's got to be a follow-up conversation with the traffic engineers to discuss the scope of that understood all right so we're going to wait to see what the, they have to say as well steve do we have an anticipated date for mcmahon's response we have mcmahon's current letter um i think that's what's referenced june 9th or june 10th uh i i don't know if that got distributed to you because it came out probably after the your packet was done it was emailed you got it in an email oh okay basically they have the same comments from the last time Any any indication from PennDOT with regard to the response, Steve? No, I haven't heard from them or really been involved in that. Okay. Does PennDOT take into consideration the types of vehicles that are coming in and going out or just the volume? Uh, in general, it's more the volume, but there is there is some different analysis for truck truck turning movements. I'm, I'm not totally up to speed on that, so I, I can't give you a full answer. Okay. All right, any other comments or questions about the uh, traffic study? All right, let's move forward. Perfect. So um, comment eight, I do want to go into some detail in terms of what we had uh, from our initial submission versus what we're currently proposing, um, as it certainly relates to uh, some of the waiver requests. Um, so just as a, um, a recap of ultimately what's uh, required versus what's proposed, ultimately, you know, require improvements um, consist of sidewalk, curbing, and um, cartway width widening along the frontages of Climber Avenue and Meeting House Road. Um, as part of this proposal, uh, one of the waivers are requesting is as far as those improvements all on Climber and acknowledging that we're proposing um, significant additional um, improvements uh, beyond the frontage of the site. And as a general um, description of what those are, I'm going to say describe it in two sections from our southernmost driveway down to the intersection of Meeting House Road and State Route. Ultimately, we are proposing to widen the full cartway width to the full required 28 feet. Um, that's uh, ultimately uh, in addition to the turning lane that's uh, intended to be proposed on State Route onto Meeting House Road. Um, ultimately, between uh, the two driveways, um, at this point, we're proposing a widening of the cartway to 26 feet. Um, that's as a result of, and to be clear, that's between the, in the both driveways, not just limited to the frontage, but the entire lane of footage between both driveways. Uh, proposed to be widened ultimately to 26 as a result of the physical constraint of a 33 foot uh, right away and several physical features in there, including utility poles, um, just becomes ultimately uh, from a constructability perspective, uh, we can't propose it and widen it to 28 without requiring additional right away at that point. Um, so acknowledging that we're still asking for the uh, waivers for curbing along the frontage of uh, Meeting House Road as well as sidewalk um, and acknowledging that though we're asking for the waiver for curbing, we are still proposing uh, some curbing uh, as a result of our curb returns. Do you anticipate any truck traffic using Climber Avenue? We don't. And uh, I believe our traffic study shows no traffic going that direction. Or I Let me clarify that, no truck traffic going that direction. Is there any way to assure that? Um, we did speak about this. I see this recommendation in there. Um, you know, we, we uh, certainly would be agreeable to, I'd have to speak to Adam if there's uh, some discouragement in terms of these radii of our entrance driveways that would discourage that movement for trucks. And then also 
uh, signage not only pointing them towards um, you know State Road 309, which is their ultimate destination, um, but restricting movements to the left. I yeah. mean, we're 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 open to restricting that. That's not a that's not a movement we're anticipating uh, the uh, trucks making. How yeah. about coming to your facility? GPS tends to send people in funny directions. Um, yeah, I it, difficult to control that. Um, uh, and I say difficult. I'm I'm not sure how to control that, but um, just in terms of the overall aerial, you know, we were trying to, I guess, war game how you know what trucks would actually be coming from there. I know there's traffic, you know, today that finds its way over to to Meeting House. Um, coming across there, but, um, you know, between quarry and meeting house to get back to state road 152. That, that, the reason I'm asking you, like, I would question whether or not we would need improvements on climber. If this, if this business is going to be generating truck traffic, not anticipating, but the possibility is always there, you know, like I said, most likely for incoming, not outgoing. Well, I, our, our proposal in terms of the street improvements, I mean, adding in the right turn lane is over, um, you know, in addition to, to stormwater improvements and removing that access from climber, I mean, we're improving over, I think it's 2,100 feet of, uh, of street as part of this development that, uh, that benefits uh, everybody along Meeting House there, um, you know, versus 800 feet of frontage on climber. Mm -hmm. Ryan, when you, uh, this is Tony, uh, you singled out the truck traffic um, using Meeting House Road. What traffic would be using Climber Road? Uh, automobile vehicle traffic. And that's just, uh, in our traffic study, it has more detail on that of anticipated movements. And I just point out that that traffic study um, shows 100% of the, the movements um, on Meeting House going southbound, it has vehicular traffic. Um, and I, again, it's just an assumption, but uh, some percentage going north. In other words, employee traffic. How, how many employees do you are you anticipating out of curiosity? Um, we typically see on these uh, one per 3,000 square feet. Um, we actually have quite a few users on this, but um, or I say a history of users on this, but it typically ends up being about one one employee per three thousand square feet of of floor area. Okay. I see the. Uh, this is Alex speaking. I see the uh, entrances have curbing going both uh, up towards State Road and back down towards Climber. Is that just to make enough room for the trucks to turn in there, or is there a reason that those radius is heading down towards Climber? Is that related to the car traffic? Yeah, just I can jump in. Just to confirm your return, you're referring to the curb returns uh, on the north sides of each driveway. Correct. Um, ultimately, the um, Intent is to accommodate truck traffic. We have some truck turning uh, to specifically turn in and out of the site, not to be clear, turning left north, but simply to accommodate a maneuver in which a truck is turning right out of the driveways headed south towards State Route. At the same time, a truck might potentially be turning left into the site. They need some additional room to swing around. So ultimately, that's that's the intent with those curb returns, not not intended to accommodate a truck turning um, left out of the site headed north. Steve, what's your thought with regard to the 26 versus 28 foot widening? Um, well, there, there, I mean, there definitely is some physical constraints. Uh, there's another comment that I don't, I'm not sure that we got to yet, um, I, where I also suggested. Uh, potentially limiting either incoming or outgoing trucks to the southern access. So that would uh, 
the thought there was to eliminate to essentially eliminate two-way truck traffic in that stretch that's only 26 foot wide you know to to alleviate any issue with with the road width um And the, the barriers from widening you've mentioned the uh, is that from a cost standpoint or is it some kind of physical well it's barrier? physical and, and the right of way isn't there with the 33 foot wide right of way um because we need to get some drainage you know can't just widen the road and not know where the water's going either so uh there's you know room for a rosite swale or, or grading to make it blend back in to, to, to the existing grade and things. And how does that become our problem? I yeah. didn't say it was. I just said no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying from the standpoint of a waiver, yeah. how does the fact that they can't fit the 28 foot widening in there? Yeah, I'm just curious as to why, well, we, why we wouldn't enforce that to, to play devil's advocate part the large part of that is not on the front end of their property it's it's off-site you know if it was on the front end of their property up then yeah there's no question at all that that should be full width improvement but the front end of their property on um, meeting house is really limited to the two driveway entrances and there's they are widening that because it's essentially entirely taken up with the the driveway entrances on both sides right okay so we were left with the area that's in front of the three adjoining residential properties right now, granted yeah. there is other truck traffic on the road from the you know there's several small businesses on meeting house and around the corner on on climber as you go toward the, the bypass the dead end section right uh, so you do get that traffic but i you know i've I, I'm in and out of there all the long, all the time. I don't see a lot of tractor trailer traffic. I think there's a lot more. Right. It's more probably box truck, truck. Yeah. traffic. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Steve, if we were to limit that to one way in and one way out, would we be able to cut back on those north side returns then? I just fear that's, that's very tempting for a driver to want to make a left coming out of either one of those driveways with that wide well, radius think- there. I think from Adam's discussion, they would have to relook at. They would have to relook at that to make sure that the the full movement in and out with a truck stopped at say coming out of the driveway and a truck coming in from meeting house would would still accommodate that even with the, the radius reduced on the north side. Yeah, I, we'd I, also I want to make sure that we could further reduce those beyond what is shown now. Definitely the one to the, the southernmost drive, without a doubt, I think has certainly has room to adjust and tweak to, um, um, let's call it, uh, discourage any sort of left out. I think we could certainly uh, accommodate that a bit more on the northern one as well. I guess what I was thinking, Steve, if, if the north driveway was entrance only and the south was exit only, then you wouldn't have two trucks coming in at the same time. Oh, fully making it one way in yeah. one way out. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And we, we did review that requirement and that recommendation. I guess from from our standpoint, this is designed as a multi-tenant operation um, where we would lease, you know, if, if it wasn't a single tenant, maybe we've got two entrance features here, highly likely that they would secure uh, portions of this truck court for each tenant's operation. And so we'd have to have access for each tenant, uh, not through the other's secured space. Um, so that was something we we could not comply with, but certainly open to restricting. I mean, frankly, traffic going north on Meeting House, there's, you know, if, if truck traffic is going that way, they're going the wrong direction. I mean, they, they need to be going towards the interchange with 309. So anything we can do to discourage that uh, signage uh, adjustments to those radii on, on the curves, I mean, we're, we're open to doing that. So you're, Brian, you're saying you, you're you're not willing to restrict truck traffic at one or both of the of the intersections. Both of them correct. have to be in and out for your intended operation. Correct. And Ryan, when you say secured, you're talking about basically fencing the building in half. 
Yeah, so what typically happen is this would be segregated. We'd have one tenant on this side of the building. Also, you know, there'd be a demising wall somewhere in this space. This operation would have secured storage and access on this side, the same with the other tenant. And we've we've gone through iterations of trying to make that work, but the bottom line is is that um, having somebody else's, you know, going through some for, through one tenant secured truck cord, it's just not feasible. Um, you know, the other thing that we run into in terms of operations of these is that we want to be directing traffic, you know, even without fencing to have uh, the drivers making a correct shoulder back in to these. And so that really uh, lends itself to having a counterclockwise circulation of the building so that when the truck is backing into the dock, the driver has full view of the of the dock, and um, you know, for instance, if there was somebody walking outside the building, um, we try and encourage that that counterclockwise uh, circulation of the building. But if but you have it segregated where they can't drive through the, the entire court, then the the south end of the building can't have the counterclockwise truck traffic. No, I, I agreed. Right. I'm just saying that that's something that we we try and encourage, especially if this were a single tenant building. If you say, well, if it's not fenced, can't use that driveway. But um, you know, if this was a single tenant with no fencing, we'd use that north driveway primarily to circulate trucks. Steve, um, I have a at what point does it become flex space when you have multiple tenants in there? Well, as long as they're all warehouse tenants, it's not. Uh, and they've committed to it all being warehouse space. Uh, so it's, I, I don't, I don't think that would come into to play is, is calling it flex space. That's what, that's sort of the discussion we had in the beginning. If I'm correct, Ryan, that you had, your initial thoughts was to have the pardon the pun flexibility to have you know different types of businesses use use the facility but then you, you since you since agreed to limit it to only warehouse use so i i think tony the answer is if as long as they're all the same use it's it would still just be under the warehouse use and and not some type of flex use okay thank you Well, it seems like we come to a crashing halt, but why don't we continue on the road improvements? I think, you know, in the big picture, the Planning Commission will need to you know, take into consideration this issue of not restricting access uh, at either one of those accesses in the big, the big picture look at the total road improvements and circulation. I don't know where you left off, Adam. I think we got uh, to see or take it up. So ultimately, that was comment eight, and then we essentially reviewed um, all these bullet points. But I'll just kind of go through them. A was in regards to the um, widening of Meeting House Road we discussed. Um, B was in regards to um, achieving the 26 feet that we're proposing, which we discussed along Meeting House. Um, ultimately. Um, C is in regards to the curbing. It's just a statement acknowledging we're proposing curbing. Uh, along the curb returns, which essentially takes up the majority of the required frontage to install curbing along Meeting House. Um, and then ultimately, um, D, I think ultimately we're, we're essentially addressing um, a, you know, with, with the current grading we have. Um, and if there's anything subsequent, uh, I think we could certainly address if there's any additional concern. Um, e is in regards to uh, the, let's call it the Climber Avenue. Um, stormwater improvements including what's called a roadside swale um, ultimately um, we're in, intending to replace the culverts along climber and i think still providing in essentially adequate um, roadside drainage but if there's any additional concern i don't think it's a major issue to work through um, ultimately in that regard um, f is in regards to the um, cross-sectional just a you know it's called providing a cross-section that's will comply in that regard um 
G is a statement uh, in regards to the sidewalk and, you know, asking the township to opine, just reiterating we are asking for the waiver uh, of the sidewalk along both Climber Avenue and the uh, Meeting House Road Prime. And H is simply a um, statement that we sort of apply with. I, I'd just like to go back to letter E. Um, one of our, in, our initial comments was <clears throat> the recommendation to have a shoulder plus the swale on Climber Avenue. Because uh, we have the situation now where the swales are right on the edge of the road. So you fall off the edge of the road right into the swale. And essentially that's what you're proposing. Um, so I do have a concern. I, I, I agree you improved the swale and, and the pipes, but we still have the situation where the swale is right on the edge of the, the edge of the blacktop. So what's the alternative? Well, potentially to put additional storm sewer in where you could lessen the swale and you know effectively have a shoulder slash swale that uh, was shallower on the side because you're able to <clears throat> put storm sewer in. Or just push it back further into the property and allow for the shoulder and the swale. Right, which is potentially for them a grading problem. Um, Steve, we can review that comment further in terms of response. I think we want to look at um, kind of the total here. I know there's some ask here regarding uh, additional improvements for some of these other developments at Meeting House and 152. Um, I kind of want to look at that holistically as to what, what that does here. Understood. If, if you know, we can accommodate it. The other thing with regard to the sidewalks, I noticed that um, the storage facility has sidewalks along their frontage. And I don't know that it necessarily makes sense to put sidewalks on the north frontage, but if we've got them there already, I think it does make sense to have sidewalks along that south south frontage. You're saying essentially extend from what's there into that access road? Right. I mean, I'm not sure why we had uh, the storage facility put in sidewalks if we weren't going to extend them further down to where the residential properties are. We don't take well, I believe exceptions. the storage facilities, it was their choice to install the full improvements. Okay. I mean, they were given the, the options were discussed of waivers or full improvements, and they chose to install the improvements. I'm not opposed to installing the sidewalks on our meeting house frontage if that's something you've asked us to do. Um, I don't know that we have, and, and that's the frontage along our two driveways for, for future connection. Um, if that's something you'd like to see. Like I said, I'm not sure the north driveway would necessarily be warranted, um, especially if it can't be done along the, the residential properties. But um, I don't know, it's just, Seeing since it's already there, it seems odd not to continue it. But like you yeah, said, Steve, if that was their if that was their call, that maybe I would, that's. A... I would tend to agree, though, Alex. This goes back to kind of the conversation we had about in the VC with regard to like when is it they're going to require sidewalks to be put in these places when you know there's sidewalks there, you might as well continue them, right? Right. Yeah, I think I agree with you that thinking. You're either putting them in or paying for them, so. Yeah, and if they're there, might as well put them in. Right. This is Andy, I agree. I don't know who's gonna use them, but. Surprising number of workers walk on lunchtime or something. So if it does get, well, if the Wawa goes in, then the they Wawa can walk in. to the Wawa. Yeah. How far does the sidewalk go toward uh, State Road? Just right there in front of the contractor services. Right. Huh. So those corner properties would have to develop if it were extended all the way to the intersection. Right. Yeah, what is that? Maybe three or four properties at best. 
Yeah, yeah I could picture two houses, but there might be three properties. Yeah. And if Wawa goes in, isn't there going to be a traffic light? One would well, expect. I hope so. <laughs> What's that? Well, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, how about it? There should be one just, with this. <laughs> Let alone Wawa going in. Huh. Just back onto that subject of the signal. I, I did have a discussion with McMahon um, and asked them to, uh, to the best of their ability, uh, approximate traffic from, from a Wawa. They, they're fairly standardized now, depending on how many pumps there are. And, and some background traffic, or not even background, but from these other warehouse facilities sort of run a uh, to run a warrant analysis based on a you know their best guess of what the traffic volumes are going to be uh, essentially to for us to know if we're if we're in the ballpark of a traffic signal with you know the ultimate build out of these of these projects uh, so that that may uh, i i haven't heard back from them but that was only you know, a week ago that we that we talked about it, uh, it would certainly give you a better a better idea uh, if if we can expect that a traffic signal will be coming, uh, and that might give us a better you know stance for discussion of ultimately the participation, if you know if any who's who's responsible and how much are they responsible for the improvements for that traffic signal. Okay. Steve, um, typically uh, curbing is part of stormwater management. And without uh, inlets on that street, what does it do to uh, Meeting House Road? And if curbing is placed on Climber Avenue, uh, what what do we have in place for stormwater in the case of that? Well, on Meeting House, it's still an open question. I have a comment asking for additional information about drainage on on meeting house uh on climber that's the, the roadside swale that they were pro proposing to regrade that i'm asking you know, we had asked in the beginning for a shoulder there to push that away from the road to get that swale away from the road so that would go back into their uh detention basins is that what the idea is oh no not on on well, climber, well, you, you're already downstream, you know, so to speak, downgrade of the basin. So, no, that wouldn't go to the basins. That that goes across the street, and it would go down towards uh, what is that? Down the, uh, to the quarry. Creek. Well, if it's curbing, it would it would be redirected and go down to Quarry Road, correct? Well, no, there there would still be the cross pipes under under another road. Okay. Okay, and I'm so not that, sure, Tony, but I think on Climber, it may actually be downhill basically from the driveway for a drum towards um, towards Meeting House. Yeah, there's a high point in there somewhere, Alex. I, I agree that it's not necessarily all going towards Quarry Road. And I think that's why there is multiple culverts there now, because there was you know, a low point in there somewhere that they needed to drain out. Okay. So stormwater would go under climber and spill out downhill on the north side of climber. Correct. Those two basins that are on one at the corner and one at essentially where the old entrance was are the two stormwater basins. They would be connected to those replaced culverts under climber that's what's right. proposed correct adam yeah that's exactly correct and and that's kind of related to comment 11 that i intend to get into um but just to clarify the the high point is essentially at the middle of the site is where essentially the split occurs and and water then flows north and south Adam, we were referring to climber road i think there's a high point oh yeah climber to the uh, west of, of where you guys are. But. Yeah, and then the low point is essentially at the middle of the site, the northern middle. 
I believe that's private property. Isn't isn't that correct? Across the street. Yes. Yeah. That's so where we leave off at number nine, Adam. Yeah. So in regards to number nine, um, to be clear, is essentially a will comply. Um, we are intending to dedicate ultimate right away. So um, that that's ultimately will comply and will be indicated on the record plan. Uh, ultimately, in regards to uh, number ten, um, it's called ten A um, references the. Um, waiver request we had in regards to the um, three to one slopes in lieu of the four to one uh, that's let's call it a, a two part a, it is certainly will comply on the slope stability analysis to provide just justification to support that it's actually under process and we'll submit that as soon as we have it and then the let's call it second part is in regards to the um, erosion control matting installed on uh, the the berming because uh, ultimately acknowledging those are uh, you know, three to one slopes and, you know, just clarifying the intent will be to install um, any sort of erosion control matting on those and anywhere else we may have some slopes uh, three to one. You satisfied with that, Steve? Yeah, we, we've done this before on commercial sites. Right. I think we've, we've stuck to the four to one slopes on residential properties but um, you have waived it with similar conditions on commercial sites and three to one is a mobile slope which is that at, at some point in the past when we updated the ordinance we did to flatten it a little bit to four to one to give a little bit easier slope for people to maintain right Perfect. Um, so if there's no other questions on that, uh, just moving forward to uh, part B, um, ultimately in regards to the uh, retaining walls, acknowledging there are retaining walls on this site um, associated with the grading and understand that there's a comment in regards to uh, providing some additional landscaping or pattern faces along the walls visible to offsite. I'm um, just confirming uh, in terms of uh, what just so everyone's clear in terms of what walls are visible there's the wall along the um let's call it western portion of the property line which uh the site is ultimately let's call it lower so any visible face is internal to the site so i believe the comment is likely more specifically in regards to the wall along the north in which case the let's call it visible face of the wall the down um, grade side of the wall would be visible from climber avenue I'm just wanting to acknowledge that there's certainly uh, currently significant landscaping proposed uh, all along Climber Avenue, um, both uh, shade trees, um, deciduous trees, ultimately um, shrubbery and uh, several different landscaping. Uh, and then I think I can let Ryan speak to any sort of you know potential you know, acknowledgement for input in terms of colorizing of that wall. That's something you're willing yeah. to do. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's something specifically you're looking for there. Those are uh, going to be designed as modular block walls. Um, we've got landscaping. I can revisit with the landscape architect here in terms of anything further we can add, but I didn't know if there's something specific you were, you were looking for from us there. It, there wasn't. It, it, this comment generated with me. I, one, wanted to make the Planning Commission aware of the you know the, the relative size of these walls they're not mm -hmm. three or four foot retaining walls they're, they're sizable walls uh, and as adam said some of them especially the ones in the back of the building are really facing in towards the building and they're not of consequence to anybody but but your building but i would agree that probably the largest impact one would be uh, that that you colored in blue there along on climber avenue um, and that's we had no details on the wall so you know you're talking about a segmental block wall at this point I, I can provide an example and um you know in terms of input on color or things like that i mean that uh you know we have no horse in that per se and um, 
I, I guess we, my fear we have, was, have softened be, it quite a bit with landscaping. Yeah. I guess my fear was, you know, I envisioned, oh no, that that's a poured concrete retaining wall. It's going to look awful, <laughs> awful and industrial right there along the, you know, 11 foot high wall along the road. No, I can yeah, provide yeah. A, a sample of a typical product for that. I think that would be right. Helpful. And would these be more like the the two by two by four Lego kind of blocks? Would these be more like a split face kind of retaining wall blocks? Yeah, you know, would, like the eight to twelve inch blocks. Yeah, typically more of a, a, a heavier split face type modular block system um, that has kind of a, a broken face to it. Um, so it's got a little bit more pattern. And typically there's, you know, three or four standard colors with those to blend in. I think the concern, and I, it's it's certainly valid along there. I mean, we added uh, a pretty substantial amount of landscaping along that just to soften the, the height of it as well. This is Andy. How about any consideration for noise and echoing and bouncing around off of the 11-foot the wall, the 15-foot wall off the... 35 foot building can the block uh maybe can we take that into consideration with the wall or do something to uh you know not only look good but uh maybe you know mitigate that um in terms of what what we can't do very easily on it is cantilever it above um you know like i said we've looked at uh the likelihood of um, you know having having some fencing along that side and if that's you know commitment in terms of uh, you know a solid fence along that side that's put in, um, that may that may assist with that. But do you have any views of the elevations currently on the plans? Like what what these walls are looking like from you know from no. climber? Or... <clears throat> no, we don't. All right, so you're going to look into providing something for us to uh, take a look at in regard to block color and pattern and landscaping. Yes. All right. Now let's move forward. I think you're on comment C of 10. Yeah, perfect. So comment C ultimately, uh, I think, is generally a statement acknowledging that, you know, there's a cut fail that we had submitted. Um, and acknowledging that topsoil is not permitted to export off the site, um, essentially a statement that we intend to comply with. Out of matter of curiosity, where do you plan on losing that soil? So well, I, I, I guess I'd speak to that, Adam. I mean, in terms of Bowler's calculation on this, I think you're just assuming everything here on topsoil. Um, you know, I'm under no illusion that when we dig in this, the topsoil is going to include some some buried treasure out there as well. So I don't think that excess is going to be quite what's what's shown here, just because, um, just because of the past use of that property. I think we're going to find some some more debris out there. Um, some of that's been indicated on the geotech, and that's going to have to be removed. Um, but and then I guess to, uh, you're starting to indicate the question on that in terms of of uh, losing topsoil. I mean, we do have the ability. We've got some green space here for for spray irrigation. I mean, we we definitely have to see if there was uh, excess beyond our calculations on that. But um, you know, spray irrigations. I'd certainly love to you know add it to the berms if it didn't create a slope slope issue. But that would be that would be the proposal. Yeah. Any other questions on C? All right, why don't we move on to 11? Perfect. So 11 a, um, ultimately has uh, several sections, uh, A, B, C, and D. Um, I do want to start and provide an explanation um, just so everyone can ultimately, uh, you know, hopefully be at ease or if there's any additional questions from that explanation, uh, which I prepared as part of our response. Um, so uh, obviously a lot of questions in regard to the spray irrigation, how it operates, how it operates in the winter and some concerns in the event, let's call it, the pumps ultimately no longer function. Um, just giving a, a quick recap as far as spray irrigation, not being sure how everyone um, on the call is familiar with it. 
uh, but ultimately the spray irrigation is um, a you know accepted uh, BMP which mitigates volume. Uh, we have three basins proposed on this site. Um, I label them basin one, two, and three. Uh, basins one and three are proposed along Climber Avenue, northernmost basins. Uh, basin two is the southernmost basin. Um, only basins two and three are proposed to um, contain spray volume um, and acknowledging that basin one is designed um, purely for a detention um, aspect. Um, and acknowledging that these basins two and three, though they're designed to contain spray, they are also designed to treat um, rate and ultimately the volume required um, from a spray perspective is both contained in these basins. In addition, they can store approximately I think it's on the order of three times additional volume beyond what they're spraying. So in the event that, you know, there's additional, obviously, additional volume entering these basins, it is subsequently sprayed through the spray heads and additional volume above and beyond that is um, treated through uh, the outlet control structure, uh, which is ultimately uh, reduced uh, from a rate perspective so that that flow um, exits out uh, slower. Um, than what would obviously occur without a basin. So I wanted to make that note. And then in regards to spray irrigation, uh, it's essentially uh, we have two pumps, one associated with each of the basins, two and three, uh, which is intended to operate um, on a, a typical spray fashion, um, which is ultimately um, on a delayed 24 hour uh, procedure, which ultimately does not spray anything until 24 hours after a spray event. And then it subsequently uh, pumps water into the spray heads, which are spaced throughout the site uh, to discharge that water over a six day period. Uh, so that's it. In essence, a recap of ultimately spray irrigation and what our system specifically is designed to do. Uh, so in the winter, uh, ultimately the spray uh, heads are ultimately winterized. And there's a uh, maintenance aspect in which uh, there's several valves associated uh, with the spray pump that would ultimately have to be um, operated to turn off water from entering the spray heads, and then ultimately to redirect water directly into the uh, pipes exiting these basins. Um, in that regard, the pumps are ultimately um, uh, under the frost depth, so ultimately they're, they're intended to operate during winter. Um, during those operations, um, that would operate in the same manner as it operates um, during typical operations in the sense that the pump is delayed for 24 hours after precipitation event, and then it subsequently discharges that volume across six days. So that volume across six days is, is fairly small, de minimis, I'd suggest, when um, looking at uh, the proposed uh, rate out of these basins as designed. Um, so that's ultimately the, the operation in a uh, winter aspect. Um, the winter operations are typically um, from November, mid-November to mid-March, uh, with the caveat that, you know, your first freeze is when it would tend to be winterized, and um, after your last is when it would um, begin typical operations. So let me get clarity on that. So when you winterize, are they still going to spray? No. Okay. Spray hands will not be operating during right. winter. How many other places has this system been used? I, I'm sorry? How many other places has the system of this type been used? So um, I've utilized them on, to be quite frank, almost every single project <laughs> in the past um, two years. Um, it's, uh, I'm not going to call it entirely, entirely recent. It's a widely accepted BMP um, that PADEP accepts to mitigate volume. Um, that we've used um, quite often um, in regards to karst areas is where it essentially sprang about, if you will, uh, because it essentially spreads out your water across a much larger footprint. Um, so we've used it extensively up uh, within uh, Northampton and Lehigh Valley, um, and we're ultimately been seeing it proposed more and more. It's fairly common. John. Yeah, it, there's a spray system incorporated in the Grandview Hospital project. Okay. Yeah. 
see if you're comfortable with the uh, your stormwater calculations and whatnot. Yeah, my 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 concern, which which Adam clarified in this latest round, was uh, I was uncertain when it was going to pump during the the winter conditions. I was what I wanted to see, and and they are proposing there is still the 24 hour delay. So let's take Rocco Mini storage. You know, they they have a concern. They voiced a concern with the extra volume in in a flooding situation that they have out at 309. Right. Well, this the spray irrigation system that's that's the only part of the stormwater that actually takes volume out of you know out of the flow um so that's why i wanted to make sure during the winter during the winter operations that they were still going to delay that flow for 24 hours so most of the you know the flood water will be gone in 24 hours for the most part the peak flooding time will be gone in 24 hours so then the basin could drain out slowly in, into the storm sewer system right uh, that said, their their rate control is is uh, you know pretty substantial. So the during storm flow is is cut down a good bit also. So uh, you know other than a couple of minor comments that we have and some engineering detail comments, generally satisfied with what they're proposing. Steve, I have a question, and that's regarding the culverts going under climber. Um, if that flow is being increased at all, that's pretty steep there, and I can't imagine it would erode pretty seriously going down that hill towards the creek. Correct. It would, um, but they didn't. They they reduced those flows. Um, substantially. Which okay. comment I have it listed in. Yeah, substantially. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's essentially comment B, where we kind of get to that. And yeah, it's, it's a substantial reduction, and, and it's noted right here in the comment. You know, yeah, the 80, eighty-five percent reduction. Now, now, granted, that is that is a rate reduction. So at any given time, you know, pre what the pre-development conditions are to the post-development, the rate of flow should be reduced by up to eighty-five percent. Uh, as they said, that the you have one of those basins has the spray irrigation system, correct? On that, that's correct. Outside. If you're looking at the plan, it would be uh, the one to the uh, bottom of the plan. Right. So that that that's the one that'll help then cut down the total volume that leaves the site. Also, I can't tell you what a percentage is on that, but um, yeah, ultimately that to be clear, that volume reduction is compliant with both township and DEP standards. Approximately, what is that? Do you know? Uh, so, volume reduction? Uh, approximately 33,000 cubic feet is essentially what's intended to be reduced and sprayed from that basin. As a percentage, what would that be? Would you say? I, I don't know it offhand as a percentage. Okay. Yeah, it, just to provide more clarity, the requirement is to reduce your two-year uh, volume, and if that means anything to anyone on this call, the two years is essentially a storm that um, occurs, has a chance to occur once every two years, so fairly often um, the volume reduction requirement is the difference from your pre- and post-development um, improvements um, from the volume associated with that storm. But it effectively works for any storm. Yeah, correct. It, right. it, it continues it's to design based storm. on that two-year storm volume, but it it's in effect for every storm event that it rains. Right. Understood. Thanks. All right. Should we move forward? Perfect. Uh, so the next comment here is in regards to comment B, and I think we kind of touched on this a bit. Um, but in terms of uh, the reduction that's currently proposed, you know, acknowledge that we're reducing a significant amount uh, to 85 percent in rate, obviously, from the uh, pre and post development flow um, and ultimately acknowledging that we have one basin that operates uh, that one most basin that operates um, as a standard detention basin facility um, in that regard. So ultimately, um, if there's any additional discussion or concern in regards to that, um, we can kind of go through it. We do have an off-site 
discharge plan um, exhibit if we want to discuss further. So it's the intent of Veris to basically be the property manager on this once it's constructed. This wouldn't be sold in once it's developed and occupied. Um, we would have a commercial property manager on site. So it would be local locals of the property. That would be our intent. Got you, but you would continue to own and operate the property or just using the local management company to handle the day to day. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak to the future of the ownership. I mean, uh, these are, um, you know, these change hands. I mean, just like like owning a house, et cetera. But the, the intent would be to have an on-site operator, property management company that was in, you know, quick range of the building. Brian, uh, this is Tony. In regards to uh, B, as you talked about, and Alex brought up that um, the stormwater goes through underneath climber and goes across the property there, and there's wash out there. Um, what what plan of action do you have to take in case that happens? Well, we've got, as Adam highlighted, uh, we're reducing the, the runoff uh, rate and volume significantly from where it is today. Um, in terms of going across there, uh, we've got uh, controls in place beyond that, um, and obviously we'd have to take responsibility of that and that the operations and, and management of that facility. So we've got redundancies for additional holdback um, in the event of an impairment of that system um, in the winter operation of that system beyond just the uh, just the design of that system as of right now. And I think that would be built into the to the stormwater management agreement as well. I think it might be fair to say to answer Tony's question is the, primarily what you propose is to re, is to reduce the rate of flow coming across the street to control Correct. problems on the other side of the street um, from what they are to from what they are today. Correct reduce and and replace the existing culverts going under the road with with new culverts as well in the same location um, we did look at your recommendation steve regarding combining culverts as well um, the concern on that is that it, it changes the runoff and the location of the runoff not just um, immediately north but there's there's more than one property that this runoff crosses as it leaves the site so um you know we're open to you know like i said building and we, we had similar uh comments um from the vogels i don't know if they're on this call as well but regarding you know what happens if that spray irrigation pump is impaired um you know we've challenged adam and his design on that and and how we provide redundancy for such a situation yeah i, I can speak a bit more to that um in regards to, uh, let's say, if a pump were to fail, um, just speaking to it from a maintenance aspect, let's say a pump were to fail, the reality is that, as I indicated before, the basins are designed to contain both the spray irrigation volume and additional volume on um, the order of approximately three times uh, the, the volume that's intended to spray. It also holds. Um, uh, so in the event, let's say a pump uh, is inoperable, the reality is if it could be fixed within 24 hours, it could essentially be operating within typical um, operating procedures as it has a 24 hour delay. If it's not fixed within 24 hours, ultimately that volume is still um, controlled in a manner that it's still exiting out those outlet control structures. Um, there, there's no situation which, um, you know, the intent is to only contain just the spray volume. It contains additional volume associated with uh, the larger storms. Is there an alarm incorporated in the controls for the pumps? So someone would be alerted to the fact that a pump wasn't working? Yes, there is an alarm, and, and that gets, as far as the type of alarm, um, gets into specifics in terms of, uh, you know, it, it, what would specifically be requested from the owner. Uh, if it's, you know, remote, if it's uh, noise, you know, where it ultimately the alarm system 
and it responds to, and there is one associated with it. How deep are these basins potential and how are they fenced? Yeah, each basin is proposed to be fenced uh, ultimately uh, from a general depth perspective. Um, I don't recall if hands on the grading plan. I mean, like in the event that the pump did fail and you are retaining this additional <clears throat> runoff, I mean, like how deep could these things get? I mean, 10 feet, 20 feet? Yeah, currently they're, they're approximately 10 feet. Uh, I think one's potentially eight. Um, one's uh, on the order of, I'm just counting contours now because I don't call them offhand. Yeah, on the order of eight to 10 feet, ultimately the depths of these. Okay. So they're, they're not, you know, shallow in that regard and, and to be clear it, it may not be easy to see on the plan but if you look there's kind of like little boxes with x's that's it's ultimately intending to represent a fence um, along the entire uh, perimeter of the basin is it possible for water to get from one basin to the other uh so these basins aren't um they don't discharge into the other basin so no unless they overflow which obviously is intended not to occur so there's no overland flow between them and they're not interconnected with pipes so they don't back up each other so to speak correct i can't see the finish elevations but uh I, I'm sure you did your due diligence, but it's it's all rock, and there's there's not a lot of infiltration on that. If you're, I don't know where finished grade is, but to go ten feet, um, you know, there was a quarry right next door. It's a lot of rock there. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a. Good point. Ultimately, as part of the grading, some of the basins are proposed on partial cut and fill um, due to the slope across the site. Um, so there's a portion that's cut and a portion that's fill. So ultimately, um, I'm not going to suggest it's a full, let's call 10 foot cut in the rock. Um, and in terms of infiltration, um, that's ultimately the reason why the spray irrigation system is proposed. Uh, the infiltration on the site is um, not great. So the spray irrigation permits us to spread that water out and infiltrate across a much larger area as opposed to being held to, a, you know, essentially infiltrating um, a very uh, small sort of area. Yeah, I don't think you'll get any infiltration in that on a 10 foot cut if you can even get to that. I mean, yeah. assuming that you're at grade, I mean, I didn't look at it totally. Yeah, to no, it's a good point. The, the basins themselves are are not infiltrating. Um, the the infiltration occurs in the spray irrigation fields, which are at grade. Um, what material do you use for the berm anyways? Is that going to be imported material or are you planning on using what's on site? I mean, that's a good question. Um, that I think ultimately gets into some means and methods, but if there's material on site we can utilize, we would, uh, you know, from a typical fill berm perspective, um, you put in a clay core, so if that material is not on site, um, you know, it would have to be found elsewhere. So it would be imported. Okay. Um, yeah, because we don't, there's no clay around here, just so you know. Yeah, good point. I'll sell you some. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah, there's there's plenty up my way. Roger that. Mm -hmm. All right, we're, let's keep moving forward. Perfect. So essentially, that that was B, and I think we we spoke to C as well in regards to the operation maintenance. Um, so essentially, that's that's a will comply um, in that regard. Unless there's anything to comment. Yeah, and, and we'll just let me just touch on C since a, a couple of questions have come up. It, it is standard practice now and, and required under our current stormwater ordinance that all all properties, whether they're residential developments or commercial, that 
we have the property owner enter into an operation maintenance agreement with the township because it gives the township the ability to to oversee these these facilities and to take action if necessary so that's if you want to call it another layer of protection uh you know if 10 years from now a property owner is not uh, maintaining the basins properly. If a, if a neighbor or someone makes a complaint to the township, the township has the ability under that agreement to ensure that, that corrections are made. All right, perfect. So that's everything for C. I think next one is D which is also will comply acknowledging as I indicated before the engineering and drafting review letter um, we intend to comply with. So I have no comment there. Perfect. Uh, so moving on in regards to 12, uh, several different uh, sections and obviously relate to uh, some of the waivers. Um, I want to start with a comment A. Um, really, um, kind of touched base on this before, but just from a you know general sense, uh, you know, what we initially submitted um, in regards to uh, the shading uh, was essentially around 6%. We heard the township's concerns in regards to, you know, increasing that. We've increased that to approximately 11% by proposing trees um, along the drive aisles, as opposed to just indicating only along the, the parking areas. Um, so we're still asking for that waiver, but ultimately we've increased uh, the trees provided and ultimately uh, increase the shading percentage. That's the most you could squeeze in there? Yeah, correct. We put them all along the um, um, the drive aisles to, to additionally uh, account for that shading. Uh, I acknowledge it, it appears there's some gaps. The reality is there's walls that we can't really propose trees on top of, and there's some gaps along the, uh, let's call it south of western portion of the building ultimately to avoid uh, underground utilities right okay perfect uh so then the next comment b um is really in regards to our waiver uh request ultimately you know waiver request is uh, Still requested, um, unless there's any additional comment in that regard. So, at the last meeting, it, we had talked about waiting to get some data on what was actual uh, existing woodlands. Is that what this addresses? Well, it it, it doesn't address that, but it's it, it's impacted by that. So, separately. We came to an agreement on what historically has been wooded on the property and that was included in the natural resource calculations that were discussed earlier in the project but it does play into how much of the property is wooded and our ordinance suggests that in the pi zone if your property is not 20 percent covered with woodlands that you should increase it to be 20 percent covered um and they're indicating that they have uh 4.4 percent of the existing woodlands will be retained so there's a there's a deficit there Oof. we've had this issue on some other industrial sites too that that had asked for waivers of that requirement and have we typically granted that large of a gap um but one i could think of is uh uh thurstein milhoffen and it, yeah that that was that big for that one. Oh, the line works? Yeah. Okay. Huh. So there's nowhere to put any more trees on that property? Well, no, on, on the line works one was a little bit different because they were still, it would have taken up what was sort of agricultural area there. And Right. No, I'm, I'm talking about this property here. Well, yeah, the, the, the couple gaps, I think Adam talked about some of them, but also, um, they're the spray irrigation areas so you have all the all the piping for the for the irrigation uh, so there's a limit how many trees you could really put in those little lawn areas right 
and yeah. it really wouldn't be woods anyway you know technically but, uh, it would just be more landscape trees right All right. Any questions on the uh, trees on this property? All right, why don't we move forward? All right. Uh, so the next comment, comment 13, uh, is ultimately a, a statement. Um, ultimately, there's a report in there that indicates you know, any sort of um, environmental concerns, um, if any, were addressed with the voluntary cleanup. So ultimately, there's no environmental concerns. Okay. You know, number 14 uh, is in regards to the lighting, uh, really just a statement prior there were concerns about providing some cutoff fixtures, which we have since provided um, with subsequent submissions. I actually looked at the plan and I found it difficult to identify where the shielded units were. Were those on the, the freestanding lighting or were those on the wall mounted lighting? Yes. So the intent is to shield from the, the residential properties adjacent. Let me just pull up the plan here. basically every fixture with an s okay added to the label yeah. and shielded thank you in addition to the cutoff lenses so it is the is it is the pole mounted lights that we're yeah talking about I think you have pretty much everything on the entrance roads and across the front of the building has shields on it. Yeah, correct. Obviously, the intent shielding any any sort of residence. Um, so it is it just what you indicate everything along the entrance, everything along the, the parking lot as well, um, including going back so far as the, the everything rest. along. Yeah, the, the perimeter. Steve, you're satisfied with this given the desired protection from light pollution? Um, yes, and as much as I think that they're, they propose what we ask for, uh, oftentimes, you know, there's some things that you really can't anticipate, but you notice them after construction. And I would anticipate that uh, Barris would be cooperative with the township if we ended up with one light that was a problem or needed a shield adjusted that, that you would work with us? Yes. Okay. Good to know. All right, let's move forward. Perfect. Uh, so next comment uh, will be comment 15. Uh, that's, that's really a statement uh, for the township uh, to opine on. So you're not putting in recreation area? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. All right, keep moving. Perfect. Number 16 ultimately is a, uh, it's called will comply. Um, we are going through um, review comments with uh, the Telford Borough Authority, where um, I believe ultimately just resubmitted recently. Um, to their uh, second round. We feel we're getting pretty close in that regard. Just spoke with them about timing of issuance of will serve letters um, that should be coming shortly from our understanding. Okay. Perfect, 17, ultimately, um, just a statement. I think we've addressed that comment. We've added a knock box noted as indicated. There's no comment there. Ultimately, uh, next comment uh, 18 in regards to the uh, exemption mailer. We clearly have an exemption request out. Ultimately, that uh, will be circulated to DEP once Talbot Borough Authority uh, provides the will serve letters, which as I noted, they'll, they'll provide um, 
once we wrap up our letter, our reviews with them, which should be coming in short order. Just keep in mind, Adam, Telford has a tendency to sign the planning module where the township has to sign it. Which okay. is fine, but don't mistake that for not getting our signature. Uh, okay, no. <laughs> we, just, we just make another copy of the form and sign it ourselves too. Okay. Uh, but for some reason, Mark tends to sign it where we we need to sign it. No, it's a good point. I keep an eye out for it. Um, there's no other comments there uh, in regards to comment 19, um, essentially in regards to you know approval of, it, of an MPDS permit. Um, ultimately um we're going through that process here um we have that submitted into um the conservation district and dep for technical comments i acknowledge there's a statement here in regards to um, some adjustment to the sequence as uh, it was submitted to the township and uh, i had a subsequent follow-up uh, with steve i think we're, we're of a, an agreement that we can ultimately propose those um as requested uh, with the understanding that you know may need to be uh, readdressed here with the conservation district. Okay. Perfect. There's no other comment. Comment 20 is ultimately a, you know, will comply. Um, you know, when, once that monumentation is installed, um, the proper documentation will be acquired. I imagine there's no comment there in regards to comment 21 uh, is a uh, will comply as well. Um, we've submitted a, a cost estimate and if there's any comments, uh, we can um, modify them as necessary. Sure. Perfect. And then last comment 22, acknowledge this before there's the engineering drafting detail review letter, uh, which are all uh, to be clear will comply. So we intend to comply with all of those. All right. So were there items we needed to circle back to? Or do we end up touching on everything? I, I know we had skipped some items in the beginning of the discussion. I think the main items that I um, requested we revisit would really be the waivers because we discussed several of the additional justification um, throughout the, the review letter. So unless there's any particular waivers, we did discuss these at the prior meeting. I'm acknowledging that we removed the one for the um, uh, parking stall size. I thought back in February, it talked about providing LIDAR on an aerial for the 100 feet beyond the property boundary, just to get some sense of what was going on there. Yeah, we, we provided LIDAR um, on the offsite discharge exhibit that we prepared, which I believe we even have an exhibit this evening. You know what sheet that would have been? It is OD1. That's not in the plan set, though, is it? Um, yeah, it's prepared as a separate exhibit. I'm sorry, you said the lighter was shown on there? Yes, it is. It's very light with the aerial background. Kind of difficult to see on the screen. Right, I see it on like Meeting House Road, but I don't see it going anywhere near 100 feet from the site. Yeah, but I could certainly revise that exhibit, but I'm looking at my screen, it, it, it's there. I think there's just... Yeah, maybe if you did it in different colors, something would show up better. So I could certainly revise that, make it clear. If I need to zoom it out, I certainly can. I thought there was another revision of that where uh, those two were tied together. 
Yeah, we subsequently got a survey update that clarified that. So this would be the latest. If you could show that when you have a chance, please. Thank you. Yeah, I certainly revised that and clarified. All right, does anyone have no, I, I opened it. I opened that OD1 drawing on my screen, and I it, it is the, the LIDAR is in there, it's just really grayed out. So, yeah, Adam, if you could just adjust that for benefit of the planning commission, yeah, absolutely. And you might have to extend it on the quarry side, yeah. I think I can zoom it out a bit just to make sure yeah, you probably clip it. that a little close on that side. All right, are we ready to move forward here? Um, is there any more, any other questions on the uh, waiver requests? The storm pipe's no big deal. It's all on site, right? Yeah, they're proposing concrete in the street and, and uh, HCP on site, which we have approved before. Sure. Yeah. I just want to make sure it was on site and in the street. All right. I, I, I will say, Chris, though, on, on the bigger picture, you know, that I guess particularly the curving sidewalk and widening, you know, those waivers are sort of interrelated with the the road improvements and the offsite improvements that they're that they're proposing. So uh, I don't know if you're prepared to to say you're in agreement with that final design, or if we want to wait till we get some of the things we talked about today, and or the McMahon comments result. Yeah, I would prefer to wait till we get it all. To be honest with you. Well, yeah, then the sidewalks too that we talked about out front, right? <clears throat> have to get them cleaned up yeah and i say that in part because they are requesting correct me if i'm wrong guys but you're, you're still looking for a preliminary final approval process correct uh preliminary approval i don't i think it's fair to say we're not we're not in a position for final approval at this time Okay, because you had originally asked for that, I think. Agreed. Okay. Quick, well, quick, there's Ryan. Time. Ryan, I think um, I think we want preliminary uh, final. Um, it, that's a technical issue in Pennsylvania. You may not be familiar with, but I think we want to uh, stay on that track. Okay. I have a quick question uh, with regard to the. 300 foot turn lane on state road, uh, route 152 there, state road. There was a right of way needed. Who who does that, who do you get that from? Who, who does that right of way um, come from? Um, that's from the, from the Vogels and it scales right now. Obviously the plan would have to be approved to about 500 square feet. Um, there's actually a, a pretty significant portion of PennDOT right away that allows for a construction of the majority of this, but it's actually this radius that comes into that encroachment. Okay, and have you obtained that? No, we haven't. Okay. And, and it it wouldn't be something that we'd obtain. It would be an agreement to dedicate at completion to the township. Adam, is this plan consistent with the the, the plan I sent you for the mini warehouse, or has that not been updated for that yet? Yeah, that, that's somewhat incorporating you can kind of see um, the right of way line um, along that intersection. But I don't think this particular exhibit was updated. All right. So I was going to say there should be a radius at that intersection from the 
from the land development plan to some degree. I don't know that it's enough for what you need, but there's something there. And another quick question with regard to warehousing use on a, uh, in a building this large, what's your experience with regard to number of truck trips per day if it's a strict warehouse use? Yeah, I, I don't want to contradict. I know we've got a traffic study on that that studies, um, um, you know, I mean, from the IT, IT, ITE data. That is in the traffic study, though? Yes. Yeah, total number of trips from the from the building. And that's, fr that's from the uh, land use 150 code or the warehousing use, and that's from a study of, you know, literally thousands of buildings. Right. But I mean, do we have an idea what that number is based on the square footage of this building? I believe it's 50, but I, I'm going from memory. Okay. This is Andy. Um, Brian, just a, a quick question. Um, on the, uh, the fenced in section behind the building, we kind of touched on that briefly, but I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about that and what that you know, might might look like um, as I was thinking more about where you kind of drew the line and what it said that that would limit it to to no more than two tenants in the building, right? Is is am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. And um, is it fenced in and out, or so obviously you'd probably have to have fence in potentially what three three areas in separating and and out so. Or, or is it just, you know, preventing it? I, I don't know if you could just clarify what the what some fencing solutions might be. Yeah. Yeah. So it would it would be a fencing in of the of the truck court operations area and the loading. So it would come from, you know, the loading dock. Um, we've got a unique situation because this actually comes up to a wall along the back of the building. Um, uh, so that I'll that I'll have a rail along the back of it anyway. I think we've actually got fencing shown there right now. Okay. Um, and then it, you know, typically either comes to here or comes to enclose, enclose the uh, trailer parking over on the on the other side. And then if you've got more than one tenant, this splits. You know, there's actually a, a physical separation inside sure. the building, separate services, and then there'd be a fence limitation across or uh, delineation across the truck court. So, so I see trailer storage for 27 trailers along along the left hand side there. Um, so for them to like, let's say your tenant that's on the, the south side, if you will, wanted to, you know, is, is the intent that the trailers there could be parked and be used by tenants, you know, throughout on either side of the building? If no, if we had something where we had a tenant that was using the trailer parking, um, you know, typically these are leased. It's not a 50 50. It's we we lease up the majority tenant uh, first. And if they required the trailer parking, we would shift them up to that north end of the building uh, with the trailer parking. I also note in the comments, it talks about um, 44 loading docks. Um, that's actually not the day one condition. It's uh, 18 loading docks, and at those empty dock positions, we've got additional trailer parking uh, spaces against the building. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the off dock positions. And and this is just a stupid question, maybe, but a lot of the warehouses that I'm familiar with don't don't have this fencing. You know, they're they're open all around. Kind of, the, what, what's the reason for the for the fencing? Um, it, it depends on the specific tenant, um, but I, I would actually say the a majority of the ones that we deal with do end up uh, fencing their truck court, and it's just, it's just to keep that area secure overall or to control just random traffic coming in, being able to prop up a loading dock door, um, you know, after hours, et cetera. Um, it, it, it depends on the tenant, but uh, we, do, we do see it as quite common for, for a security concern. It's uh, it's often a homeland security requirement. If uh, the product at any time touches the federal government, uh, either through funding or other sources, uh, they have certain security requirements uh, for the um, storage of it, and that often um, is is why this uh, occurs. Ryan, okay. can you explain that difference between the 18 docks and the 44 docks again? 
Yeah, so this building is set up along the rear elevation of it. And um, give me just a second on that sure. on the exhibit here. Yeah, there's what I wanted. So you set it up for every other panel. You know, these X out locations are a potential. For instance, if a user needed a specific dock at this location relative to their material handling plan, we could cut in another dock location. But day one, uh, this indicates the number of dock positions to be installed. Um, okay. So, so start with 18 with a maximum potential of 44. Right. But uh, with with the uh, existing condition here, I mean, all these are available positions against the building where somebody could could park a trailer as well. And I could go back to to Tim's question about the, the trip rate, I happen to have the study here, and it appears that it was figured as an average weekday uh, trip generation of 45 trucks. Uh, Ryan, this is Tony. I have a couple questions. Can you go back to the very beginning um, when you proposed the um, use of the building and the picture of it. Um, I think it was like about the, uh, go back one more. Or, or go the other way, I'm sorry. That one, yes. Um, I see that in that picture, you, you know, have sidewalk proposed in that picture and stuff like that. But, um, what i don't see or my question is uh take that particular building what, what roughly what size square feet is that building in that picture uh this one is one hundred and sixty thousand square feet One hundred and sixty thousand. um and then uh what i i guess you're familiar with that site but what how close would be a resident to that building roughly uh, there's there's one residential property to the uh, trying to get my orientation here to the uh, west and then another one to the south. It's and all um, full disclosure that's that's across from a major public roadway on that side. Uh, there's one property here that was a, a residential to the east that was a residential use on an industrial zoning. Um, but that's but I mean like um, you know. Footage wise, yardage wise, like what what would that be, roughly? Um, well, from this this one, we put our uh, detention on this side of the building, so I'd say roughly three hundred feet on the frontage, and that uh, or on the west side of the building. Okay, and that sign that's out front there is that lit from that picture too? Because I, I know we discussed that in um, last or two months ago with the lighted entrance signs. Um, I, I can't see much from the picture, but um, I guess that sign is lit as well. It's it's internally illuminated and we don't have a strong position on that, whichever if there's a we didn't propose signage as part of this proposal, but I know there was discussion on uh, uh, denoting the entrance locations, and this would be similar to what would be installed there, obviously subject to approval from the township. Um, but whether this is externally illuminated with just a, a flood, you know, shining back onto the sign or in, internally illuminated, um, you know, makes no difference to us. Okay. All right. I, ju I just, the reason why I'm asking is because um, I believe there's three residents in I think two of them in each side are within 100 feet of that uh, proposed entrance that you're asking. And from the picture, it looks like more of like, you know, a, a wide open area versus meaning that there's residents that are sandwiched between the facility. That's all I was asking. No, it's a fair comment, and I certainly wasn't presenting this as being an exact. I was more just presenting this to be an image of the the final 
on the quality of the building. Um, the one thing that that you know that we are proposing that this building doesn't have is the buffering um, along those adjacent properties. Right. That's I, another thing I was going to ask you too. Is that I know you you showed a picture, but it, it'd be nice to see a larger picture on how exactly the buffering really is. But um, okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Any further discussion from planning commission member? This is Andy. I mean, in my mind, just looking at it, the two main things are traffic and, and stormwater. I, 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 um, I think we discussed stormwater pretty extensively. The, the traffic part of it, um, um, yeah, I, you know, just talking and going back to the very beginning and, and the light on, you know, State Road and the not having a need for that. I, I just want to, but overall, I want to, I, I think it's important to be comfortable with the, the overall traffic study and all, all angles and, and all, you know, a, a comprehensive view of the of the traffic um you know uh what 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 they have here now what potentially is coming in and just want to make a an informed decision you know with with all the information on that yeah i agree i mean if you're talking this building at 45 trips a day and then a building you know a mile down the road that's double the size which would be another 90 yeah, you're 135 truck trips a day a two mile stretch or thereabouts of 152 and a Wawa across the street. I can't fathom that you're not going to have a white here. So I'd like to see, you know, these traffic studies. Oh, and that's not to mention the potential one on Cat Hill or how that's going to work out, too. So, yeah, I, I mean, I I think the traffic studies on these need to be coordinated and figured out and a lot more to do with regard to that. I, I can give you one piece of information. My cousins own the Wawa chain, and uh, my understanding is they won't go any place that doesn't have a traffic light. So Wawa's not going there unless there's a tra unless I guess they cause the traffic light. I'm I'm sorry, I didn't. Can you identify yourself? Because uh, I we did a roll call in the morning or in the morning <laughs> early morning, and I don't. Did, can you identify yourself? Sure, Elkie Weatherall. I'm the regional partner for Veras Properties. Okay, Elkie, thank you. All right, and I, I'm in agreement with with uh, both of your comments, uh, Andy and Tim. Um, the, the traffic aspect of this is is daunting and there's so many unanswered questions with the other proposed projects um i i really i, I don't feel i'm in any position to uh, grant a preliminary final with that more information on that traffic study yeah and cleaning up things that we talked about visual regard to uh you know the sidewalks the other things we we're talking about i think there's enough here that needs to be cleaned up in addition to the traffic issue you yeah. Yeah, this is John Snyder uh, representing Veris. Uh, understanding the traffic issue, we're willing to work with the township in trying to uh, provide some uh, reasonable contribution towards something like that. But the idea of coordinating traffic studies for projects that are well behind us is a delay that you know, we're not, we're willing to do what we can so that we can keep moving, but we, we do want to keep moving. We don't want to be pulled back to those uh, other projects. Understood. Um, well, I mean, we do have um, our local track of traffic folks that uh, Steve had try to uh, get some information as some some projected information um, incorporating these two two or three other projects which would 
would be an aid. And then we're also waiting on PennDOT, which I don't. Yeah, know. we haven't even heard from PennDOT yet. So right. I'd like to hear from PennDOT and everything else and see what see what they say with regard to even just this program, this project, and whether it requires a light and what they say. Yeah, I understand, and we're willing to keep working with them, but you know, on a on a basis that isn't a delayed basis because of other projects that may or may not go forward promptly. Understood. Does the project that causes the light to be required responsible for paying for the light? In general, yes, but we're not saying that. We're saying that we're willing to talk to the township about participation, but we we you know we're we need people to talk to. No, I, I understand. Actually, I, I, I agree with your point. I, I don't think that projects behind you should hold you up. You know, if, if, if under, under that, that thinking is if you're ultimately the project that causes the light to be installed, then it's on you. If it's ultimately the next project that's required, that requires the light, then it's on them. I, I I don't know that it's a, it's a package deal. I think it's a one at a time deal. Generally, yes, John. Um, I mean, the, the the downside to that is you know you potentially get incremental improvements and and not a holistic look at the at the situation. Uh, but I think as Chris just just referenced, if we could get some you know estimated a study from McMahon that might put us in in a better position to know what what we can expect with the other projects and and then have a have a basis for talking about participation and just come to an agreement uh, on that because it's not always just a traffic light though. you know sometimes it's a traffic light plus auxiliary lanes turning lanes widening of road there, there's it's easy to say just install a traffic signal, but it, it rarely ever comes with just putting up a traffic signal. It oftentimes comes with other road improvements uh, no, to make the, yeah, make the whole thing work. Right. I, I understand. But if if the applicant's saying that he's willing to work with the township based on what those studies produce, then what more assurances do we need? Right, right, and and the 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 idea of having McMahon get involved is to to not have to wait until they're a hundred percent complete, but hopefully get some preliminary estimate of what what's going on there. Okay. So, you folks from Veris, are are you comfortable with this plan of action? We are, um, I guess I'd asked uh, just in terms of process here, is this uh, resubmitting? I think we've got to have a huddle regarding the uh, traffic. I've got, um, you know, a half dozen notes here on additional responses we owe, but is this leading to a subsequent plan commission meeting or just what's the what's the roadmap here? No pun intended. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, think I think our desire would be able, be able to come back next month and and hopefully get moved through, uh, assuming that we come up with uh, conclusions that are decent with Steve and with McMahon and uh, the, the uh, commission agrees. But you know, the the idea would be to try and move us along with these comments as quickly as we can. Okay. Yeah. I'm we're not trying to delay the process. We just want to make sure we've got a grip on everything that's going on. Um, you know, you guys clean up, clean up your plan from discussion this evening, and hopefully, we'll get some input from these outside sources relatively quickly, and we'll be able to keep moving. So. Um, if you're satisfied with that, I, I would say, you know, we're probably good to, to move forward with our meeting. 
but I would like you guys to hang on for a little bit because I see we have a handful of people that have some questions and they you might want to be on board to help answer them if that's all right. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so I see Cliff Cole has his hand raised. Cliff, you want to join in? You got two and a half minutes. Please identify yourself and name and address. Okay, my name is Cliff Cole. I'm on uh, Shoecraft Road in West Rock Hill Township, Pennsylvania. Um, let's get this straight. Um, so we already know that the traffic on Meeting House Road is bad. And we're talking about maybe or maybe not putting a light in there. Um, let's see. They uh, we, we asked them about, like, how can we restrict truck access? And Ryan comes back and says, well, gee, you know, it's really not feasible to restrict the the." The truck access because this is not a single tenant facility and we don't know you know it's like well we don't even know who the, the tenants are going to be okay so if you don't know how the tenants are who the tenants are going to be how can you trust the truck the traffic study that you've that you've got i mean you mentioned this ite thing and um you know the, the number of 50 trucks was was thrown out but i'm guessing that's 50 trucks per tenant or something so like it's more like 130 and that's just what you're telling us um, you know, and I don't, we don't want a Wawa either, by the way, guys, uh, on the planning commission, uh, there's plenty of Wawa's out there. We don't need another one. Uh, don't put the traffic light in. If, you, if we don't build it, they won't come. Um, I, I just don't see what the reason for this thing is this, um, giant monstrosity of a building. So I'm reading from, um, let's see, I'll go on video here. Sorry. I didn't realize I wasn't on. I'm reading from our West Rock Hill Township uh, newsletter that comes out. And Jay Kaiser's got a nice letter from the chairman. And I'm quoting from him. It says, various options make for good government. I think the key to success lie in proper planning, moderate growth, and maintaining the rural township, rural characteristics of this township. So how does building a monstrosity warehouse like this fit into moderate growth? And um, and 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 how does that fit in with the rural? Uh, I'm sorry, rural characteristics of our of our uh, township. Are we trying to compete compete with Richland Township? Okay, John, I heard your point. You know, you, you don't want any delays from this, but uh, you know, gosh, the only people I'm hearing that are really for this project are are a few people from Indiana and maybe one guy who's a lawyer who's representing them, who's local, and. Um, so this is going to employ maybe 50 people, if I'm doing my calculation right, 160,000 divided by 3,000. Uh, you know, I don't get it. It just, just doesn't okay, work. Minutes are up. Okay, well, I don't get it. It doesn't work. And the Planning Commission needs to represent its residents, not folks from Indiana. All right. Thanks, Cliff. Um, Chris Link. Have your hand up. Okay, Chris, are you there? You might be muted. You have to unmute the mic in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. <laughs> All right. Chris, we're going to move on uh, to the next person. Try to figure out how to unmute yourself, and we'll get back to you. Uh, Patrick DeSantis. Hi, I'm Patrick DeSantis um, on 2960 Climber Avenue. Um, just wanted to point out a couple things here. Um, I think that uh, a sound retaining wall uh, like you get along the highways would be super important if they're running a 24-hour business with big diesel trucks running and tailgates coming up and down and all that. And, potentially trucks just running in random areas closer to the wall. So sound would be an issue. Um, the other issue is if trucks would by chance get uh, mistakenly rerouted up the back way, that if the road wasn't improved, it would be an absolute disaster trying to make a right hand turn onto Meeting House Road for a tractor trailer. That would be a, just a disaster trying to do that. It's not easy. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up 
uh, was in uh, <clears throat> it was in regards to the drainage, of course, because everybody wants to drain two of those retaining ponds onto my property. And uh, I don't think you guys are taking into consideration that one inch of rain per acre is 27,154 gallons of water. You're going to cover up 17 acres. With one inch of rain, 17 acres is 465,000 gallons of water, roughly. If you get a three inch rain, that's 1.4 uh, million gallons of water. I would like to know how much each retaining pond is um guesstimated to hold uh, based off of your figures and <clears throat> it kind of doesn't make sense to me that if you know on a three inch rain if we can get 1.4 million gallons of water you guys are intending on making those pipes bigger for what purposes to flow more water maybe i mean i'm just putting one and one together here and it's not rocket scientists you know rocket science here but you know, it seems like you guys are building this up to deal with the aftermath later once the building's already in, and then we can fight our way out of a wet paper bag with you guys later. I don't think that's a good plan. And I don't think you guys are being considerate at all. And I don't see anyone in this room for this project either, except for people out of town. So I would like to see our local board members encourage a little more stringency on two and a half minutes are up. Who's doing business here? And nobody's gotten back to me. My attorney has sent you guys a letter uh, to get more details about all of this. And nobody's gotten back to me. And it's been over a month. So I'm curious if anyone else has had that experience. Okay. Thank you. Somebody will answer that question for you. Uh, Chris Link, you're finally unmuted. Yes. My apologies. Technology is not my friend. <laughs> um, I would like to kind of echo what Cliff said. And, Chris, can you um, can you give me your uh, full name and address? Yes, please? I'm sorry, Chris Link. I'm a resident of West Rock Hill Township. I live on Branch Road. What What is your actual address? One nineteen West Branch Road. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to echo what Cliff had had asked. I mean, how many Wawas do we need in a three mile radius? Uh, to begin this. So for John's statement that we should push the cost of any traffic signals uh, onto the Wawa, I disagree. There's times of day that I cannot make that left-hand turn from Meeting House onto State Road currently. So don't tell me that the additional truck volume is not going to cause additional problems. I hear about a right-hand turn lane coming off of State onto Meeting House but what about right-hand turn laid off of Meeting House onto State? Um, because the trucks are going to be lined up trying to turn left there. So there's not a lot of options. First question. Second question. Um, what time of day were these traffic studies conducted that indicated that there's no uh, need for these traffic signals? Uh, also, what are the proposed office hours or operational hours for these warehouses? Um, are there ordinances in within the township that are already going to restrict what they're proposing? I'm hearing rumors. These are going to be 24 hour a day operations. Uh, this is a residential area. I understand the zoning probably doesn't agree. Not too far around the corner. There is residential areas. We've suffered from extensive flooding at the corner of lonely road and cat Hill road in recent, uh, rainstorms. Uh, so I, again, guys sitting in Indiana have no idea what's happening in West Rock Hill Township. And, and I am totally against this. And I really hope that the township is not even being swayed by any of these propositions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jackie Willard, you have your hand up. Yes. yes. My name is Jack Willard. Uh, pardon me, just, just a second. I have to mute one of our computers. Thank you for your time. Uh, I live at 2900 Climber Avenue, Telford, Pennsylvania, roughly 300 feet from the uh, entrance to drum construction on Climber Road. Um, so a beautiful building in the... Uh, uh, I believe it was Indiana, that's what everyone's saying. 
Uh, I wonder if that residential building, um, Mr. Hahn, is where you live. And to the members of the board here, I, I want to ask you a question. Do you want this going 300 feet from where you live? Um, this is zoned commercial industrial, but I'm a resident here for 62 years. Uh, there are other long-term uh, residents here. We accept that businesses go on in our area. We have never had a 24 seven business in this area. Traffic uh, at Meeting House and State Road, I'm less than a mile from there. I walk, I ride my bike. Um, there are times, uh, specifically in the afternoon, when traffic waiting for the light at 309 is backed up past Meeting House. Um, not only don't, don't I think that a light would solve that, but I think that this additional truck traffic would be harmful. Uh, both my speakers are muted right now, so I'm going to cut my time off early. I hope I didn't uh, go over. I am against this project. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Stephen Kratz. Hi, I'm Amy and Steve Kratz, 3270 Meeting House Road. Um, both in February and again in May, we shared our resident perspective regarding um, this proposal and we continue to agree with our fellow uh, neighbors that we are opposed to it. Um, we think the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors should know that in August of 2020, Ferris Partners took it upon itself to have an appraisal done of our home and our two adjacent neighbors. And in October 2020, the developer then made offers to purchase each property, citing that purchase of our property would give Ferris Partners, quote, additional flexibility with its site plan. Ferris Partners knew then, as it does now, there's no way to adequately screen and buffer the operations of the proposed site from those around it. Meeting House Road residents are not the only ones negatively affected by this plan. Our Climber Avenue neighbors downhill from the proposed development have shared repeatedly their concerns regarding drainage and stormwater runoff, in addition to subsequent noise and light pollution, as well as increased traffic that township roads are not equipped to handle. Approving a series of warehouses does not maintain the rural characteristics of this township. Massive warehouses are not the direction West Rock Hill citizens want for their township. We encourage the Planning Commission as well as our elected officials on the Board of Supervisors to vote against approving these warehouse proposals. Thank you. Um, Jeff Nolan, you have your hand up? Yes, hi everybody, thanks for having me. Jeff Nolan, 3000 Climber Avenue, Telford, PA. Um, I just wanna re-echo the sentiment of all of my neighbors. Um, also what Cliff had said, Patrick, everybody online. We didn't, we didn't buy Arian here to be completely surrounded by industry. Um, and now we have this one which, and, and the runoff is a big, big issue. You know, Patrick stated it earlier, my entire property is on this hill um, and it goes all the way up to the intersection of Climber and Meeting House. The drainage ditches right now that are going through my property, especially the one up by the stop sign, is six to eight feet deep in some areas. So it, it, it's a huge issue. And, and right now, I don't, I don't really see any, uh, any of the studies, but right now we're just kind of sitting on our hands taking our taking your word for it and if you know if we do have an issue then it's going to be all retroactive um the wawa none of the proposed items that are proposed to come in around here am i in favor of and now i hear there's one proposed on cat, cat hill road which does completely come to the back of my property as well um uh, right now, I like sitting on my back deck. I don't want to see a building sitting basically in my backyard. I didn't purchase 16 and a half acres in 
Southwest Rock Hill so that I could be surrounded by warehouses. That's all I got. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, unknown. <laughs> who who might unknown be with a hand up? Uh, well, unknown might be muted as well. No, I've got it. <laughs> you there? Thank you. Um, this is Pam West, and I live on um, Shoecraft Road, two twenty four forty Shoecraft Road. Um, you know, this building, it, of course, looks very well designed. Um, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the character of the community of West Rock Hill Township. Um, visually, it's really out of place for us. Um, I think that, um, you know, in today's world, there's always going to be pressure for industrial development in communities. I'm not sure why all these people want to be here if it's economical. But I'm one, um, I'm just wondering if West Rock Hill Township really does have to comply and accommodate these industrial projects. And is there another way? I'm not sure what our end is in accommodating these big projects because it is, um, you know, the the community, the people, the um, residents here are always wanting to have the rural, quiet rural life that they've bought into. They've made this choice. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Greg, do you have any emails? Yes, we do have one email. It's from a Dennis. Benzale uh, of 330 Old Telford, uh, Old State Road, Telford. Uh, I'm opposed to the warehouses being planned on Clymer Avenue Question. and Murray Road. The traffic would be terrible, and I do not feel these buildings are appropriate for the size of our community. Question. Uh, yeah, who is this? Please identify yourself. Uh, this is Josh Landis at 24 Bardley Road in Sellersville, Pennsylvania. Okay, go ahead. My question is, has there been any evaluation or assessment made of the diesel exhaust that will be present in the community as a result of these, of this um, project in, in all of its phases? I know there's been discussions of 18 bays and 44 bays and expansions and clients and subclients. So I'm curious to know how much diesel fuel is gonna be burned and breathed by the people in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Greg, were you done with that email? Yes, if you called it all. Okay, thank you. Anything else? That was the only one I received. Okay. All right, it looks like all the hands have been raised and answered. Um, so we need to keep moving forward. Um, so Varys, we'll, uh, we'll wait to see what comes out of the various studies and see how your plan gets cleaned up with the input that you received tonight and see you soon, I guess. Hey, I appreciate your time. All right. Have your Thank night. you. Um, I, I do have one hand up. Uh, Chris Link, you're, uh, Chris, all right, you were on earlier. Yes, the only other question that I had at this point, is there any refueling capacity at this new site for these trucks? Uh, Ryan, you still on? Can you answer that? No, there's not. Thank you. Thanks. All right. All right, now we're going to move on. So Triple Net was next on the agenda, but they have pulled out. So we are going to go into old business. Um, and we are going to talk about the comprehensive plan initiatives. So our last discussion, we got tied into lot, lot uh, minimum lot size discussion, and I 
I've seen that John had done some research this week or today. I saw it. I don't know when he actually did the research. Um, and so I, I, I guess I'll hand it over to you, John. But I, I do want to make one note here. I, we, we've had some discussion with the solicitor as we had discussed doing uh, at our last meeting. Um, and she was going to join us tonight, but I guess she didn't realize that she was going to be away this week. So she's going to join us next month um, to give us some insights on, on these matters. So I don't know if we want to have the discussion, still have the discussion tonight, or if we want to uh, push it off for a month. I, I'd like to at least take a couple minutes. And I think some of this will tie into some of the previous comments is... Okay. I spent um, quite a bit of time actually going through the zoning documents for all of the townships in Northern Bucks County, uh, Milford, Richland, Tinicum, Nakamix, and Haycock, Bedminster, all, the, whole, the whole lot, and looking for specifically what minimum lot sizes and open space requirements were for um, single family dwellings and, and i was just looking specifically for that because that's really where this discussion kind of started a couple months ago about um are, are we too too loose on what our requirements were and, and saying as john the resident rather than john the planning commission member i was actually very disappointed because in the documents that i went through for all the other townships I had thought that we were kind of a pioneer for conservation and preservation. Yet when I looked through the other documents, I found 24 examples of other township zoning districts that were more restrictive than our most restrictive one. So our, right now our most restrictive one is 1 1.8 acres for, for um, the RC district, but other townships had two three five ten up to ten acre minimum lot sizes for for development and kind of a comment back to the the residents that made comments before is you know despite the wording that show up and despite our best wishes it all comes down to what the zoning ordinance say that that's that's the letter of the law we we as the planning commission have some level of flexibility but you know, if if a lawyer picks up the zoning ordinance and it says it says right here in black and white, we can do this, that and the other thing. You know, it, the planning commission can't say no. You know, if we want to change if if we want to change the culture of the township to make it more rural, it starts with the zoning ordinance. So, again, going back to the, the comment about, well, can we do more? There were other examples of said townships that had uh, districts that were less dense um, in the handout that I sent along. I also included the zoning maps for um, Milford and Richland our, our two closest neighbors to the north. And both of those townships do have areas with five acre minimum lot sizes. And they're not fairly minimal. I mean, there there's a significant amount of township land that's allocated to, I think they call it resource preservation zones, districts that have five acre minimum lot sizes. So if, you know, if, if Milford and Richland and all these other townships can do it, I hope we can find a place to do it ourselves. Um, in addition to that, there were other ways of calculating uh, open space requirements and some of that was in the emails that went back and forth earlier today amongst the members is that you know the one method is what we use is just a flat out percentage you know in, in this particular district you need a certain amount of of open space based on percentage of the base the base area for the development um, other townships go a little bit deeper than that they they look into various aspects such as you know, wetlands and slopes and soil types and all kinds of different different attributes and assigned a percentage to each one of those 
to determine the amount of ground that needs to be preserved before any development can begin. So there's other things that can be done. And I uh, said, so I think if other townships can do it, we can do it too. And to the, to the residents who do want to see more of a rural culture, I, I think the, the energy needs to be directed into taking the hard look at the zoning ordinances and see what can we do, if anything, to try to make the zoning ordinance more reflective of our desire to have more of a rural culture in the township. And I know there's legal aspects of that, you know, the, and Steve has schooled us well in previous meetings that, you know, you can't make the whole township 10 acre lots anymore. That just doesn't fly. That, uh, you know, by Pennsylvania law, we're required to have a certain percentage of land in the township dedicated to different types of uses. And that needs to be adhered to. And that's that's going to affect some people because those those districts were applied retroactively. Um, you know, so if if unfortunately you have a home that you've been living in for many, many years and that home happens to fall into an area that's now zoned commercial or industrial or, or some other area. I, I don't know what the answer is to that other than you know, that's that's kind of how things developed over time. Can we fix it? Maybe, maybe we can't. But I think the, the highlight is that if we want to try to preserve the rural aspects of the township, there are things that we can do, but voicing opposition to projects that meet zoning requirements is not necessarily the place to start the, the initiative because that's really too late. So that was really my little speech on uh, on on land sizes because I said I was kind of triggered somewhat be, behind my own research and comments made earlier in the meeting tonight that um, you know that, that we're at a bit of an impasse between you know the, when the developers look for places where they can build you know the, they compare one town to, to another and they look for what areas are more not only more accessible have more utilities, but also where are the zonings more favorable from one township to the next? And, you know, that has an aspect that presents a favorability to the developers, but at the same time presents a frustration to the residents who live close to those places that, you know, what may now be an empty field or a partially forested area that's an industrial area that's going to get mowed under and build into a warehouse. And as sad as it is, you know, that's, that's kind of the reality of it, unfortunately. End of speech. End of speech. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, any comments to uh, John's findings? John, this is Alex. I just want to thank you because I know the inordinate amount of time it must have taken to go through all of those zoning ordinances and pull all of that stuff out. So I really commend you on your efforts there. Yeah, same here, John. Good job on that. So, <clears throat> yeah, with regard to that, that I mean, uh, with, with John's findings, what have you, I mean, a conversation potentially with Mary uh, going forward, I mean, what was, was there any conversation, Chris or Steve, or any indication on Mary's end as to what she thought or? Uh, Enough to speak for Mary. I'm just saying. I didn't know what the. Well, I mean, one point eight. One point eight is the magic number. Is the way I gather the info. But I mean, uh, so Steve, if you look at at what John compiled here, so Richland, their suburban residential conservation. What's the difference between that and our uh, our <clears throat> residential conservation district? Is there any, or is it just wording, or what? I, I mean, off the top of my head, I. I don't know, but okay. I mean, sometimes it's wording, but they're they're probably fairly equally batched things that are re, you know residential agricultural residential conservation res, resource protection. They're all generally lower density zoning. Right. Districts. Well, I mean, like Richland has it at four acres. I mean, how's how's Richland able to do four acres, and we got to do one point eight? I don't I don't get it. I, again, not knowing. I'll defer, into, I'll defer to Mary on that too. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the the ten acre I do know, 
and I think I sent I sent out an email. I don't know. Yeah, if that, saw, that's all saw that. That, that, that. Yeah, that that's a whole another circumstance over in Naka Mixon. So, right, um, understood. I was shocked when I saw it because I didn't even know that was in <laughs> didn't even know that was in their ordinance. But, um, yeah, I, I I don't have an explanation of how some of these other townships have done it. I, to some degree, and you know, this isn't you know this isn't a legal uh, argument, but when you get really up in the upper corner, when you're in Bridgeton, Nakamix, and you know Durham Township, they just don't have development pressure for for one thing, and most of their developments are larger lots, just because of the of the nature of the area. They can't sure. get a septic system. They're a ten acre lot, and they're only splitting it into two lots. So by default, you know they're only looking at five acre lots. Uh, so some areas like that have not necessarily kept their ordinances up to date, but also have never been challenged on their ordinances because their development. Uh, but surely, surely Rich, Richland, you would think, has been. Yeah, right. Like, yeah, I'd be more right. interested yeah. in, in how some of the more developed townships, you know, more. Even Milford for that point. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, more right. in line with, with West Rock Hill. Right. Um, with a major road those, running through it. And, yeah, maybe Mary has some more insight. I, I'm not. I'm trying to think. I don't know that they represent any of those. I represent half of these, but I can't give you good answers. Um, Mary might know a little bit about Milford, but I think she's the Milford Authority, not the Milford Township Engineer. Uh, that said, you know we did kick around our initial discussion with Mary of some other options that. Uh, John alluded to is sometimes uh, how you do environmental protection standards could play into what ultimately the density is going to be on your lot, where you don't necessarily, your minimum lot site isn't necessarily large, but if you have certain features on your property, you then have to increase. So it's, it's not a blanket large lot, but in certain circumstances, you might be able to require larger lots to meet the, to meet the standards. That yeah, we had said the overlays and what have you with regard to, you know, runoff and all that type of thing. Right. So there may be some special circumstances that you could, it's defensible to, to require larger lots than have it as a blanket. Everything has to be a larger lot. But right. again, I think Mary could give better input on the legal aspects of, of that. Understood. I mean, we now net out natural resource, right? We do, but um, we do it more. It has more impact in higher density development, uh, cluster development, and, and uh, performance. What we used to call performance standard developments, like your THP properties and the old Providence developments. When you when you're subdividing strictly single family homes on full I'll call them full size lots, but a 1.8 acre lot, uh, we don't have a lot of restrictions that would make you uh, end up with a larger lot. So we do have site capacity calculations, but they vary with the kind of development you're doing. It's not one blanket type of restriction that applies to all development. So netting out natural resource. Uh, on a on a development like like Providence would basically reduce the number of, of lots. It wouldn't and, reduce it wouldn't yeah. maximize or raise the uh, minimum on the lot sizes. It would just no. it would. and take Green Top for example. Um there there there's protection standards and they have to protect X amount of woods. What I forget what the magic number is, but let's say there's 60% of woods have to be protected. They could show that they protect the woods without necessarily making the lots larger. If they could have two acre lots or or one point eight acre lots and still manage the protection standard, our ordinance allows that on a single family home development. It doesn't make you like what John was referring to, and, and it works in our ordinance this way, developments that require open space, which are those higher density type developments, uh, like say Providence that plays into how much open space you have to have. And then conversely, that may or may not cut down on the number of lots that you could have on the property. Right. But we have we have different calculations for different types of developments. And, and I think that's an area uh, 
where we might have some flexibility to 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 change that too. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I I was really hoping that Mary was going to be able to join us tonight. Um, any other comments on on this? Now I know why Steve's job is so tough. He's got to deal with us. <laughs> well, no, not only if, I think if he only had to deal with us, he 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 might not be quite as bad. But you know, each one of those documents are, are multi-hundred page documents, and no two are the same. They're they're sort of laid out the same, but the rules vary from one to another, and uh, it it just it was a very tedious exercise trying to go through and compile what I did. And, and I actually did that for other purposes because there are some of the other um, uh, comprehensive plan initiatives that talk about things like the village districts and, and residential districts that uh, I kept all the data to, to refer to later on. But uh, it, it's it's certainly not a, not an easy data lookup exercise. Right. All right. Well, why don't we move on forward? Um, and, and again, thank you, John, for all that hard work. Um, yeah, thanks, John. Good job. My wife thinks I'm nuts. Please don't put that in the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, we'll make sure it doesn't go in. Um, all right, so we're going to move on to new business. I have no new business. Anyone else have anything to share? Chris, I will not be here for the next meeting. I will be in Venice on the 12th. You'll be where? Venice, Italy. Nice. The earphones there. Oh, good for you. <laughs> yeah, you can take your laptop. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thanks for that. You can show us a, you show us a real background then, Alex. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. <laughs> The week town. before I'll be in Munich. So hey, I, I don't have any new business, but I have a question with regard to some business that's going on. We had talked about uh the the hospital doing uh an evaluation or something of the traffic lights at Lawn Avenue and <clears throat> and 309. Do you had they done anything with that, Steve? Was there anything ever looked at or is there any not yet? Okay. It, that is, yeah, there's still a, a requirement of theirs. Uh, okay. Off the top of my head, I forget what what kicks in on the on the uh, on the timing, but in, in part it was, you know, initially some COVID concerns that we weren't going to get right traffic counts. Uh, but I'll, I'll okay. look at that again to see. It, they're 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 still trying to get things straightened out right at the hospital entrance and the and the crosswalk, <laughs> which I think they've pretty much mastered now. Okay. So yeah. If they get they get that through past that hurdle, uh, we could revisit the uh, traffic signal study. All right. Yeah. It it really is at times really really bad. I mean, it was, yeah. was going to church the other morning and three cars in front of me went through the red light heading you know towards Sellersville because the thing was so long and not changing and everybody was sitting there looking at each other. And yeah. So okay. Just was curious. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Greg, you have anything? For new business or public comment? New business. No, nothing for new business. All right. Then we're going to go to public comment. I see Cliff's had his hand up for a while. Cliff, Sorry, trying us? to find the mute button. Um, yeah, regarding the comment, the, uh, the discussion that you guys were just having. And uh, first off, I'd really like to thank you for being open to have this uh, discussion. And I really appreciate the work that John, if I hope I got the right person, put in on uh, and, and researching that. And um, you know, it is too bad that Mary wasn't on. And if, um, I think if it's, make sure I'm getting my people right, but if uh, maybe we ought to table the discussion until all the members of the uh, planning dis uh, commission are going to be on, but whatever. But anyways, but one point I'd like to make is that um, we're not necessarily, I mean, it would be good for us to look into perhaps changes, but one point that's really important is that we don't have to give variances. 
and and these guys i mean sorry 160,000 foot uh warehouse they they, re- they require all kinds of variances and um do we allow naceville to work their operation 24 7 i don't think so uh, I don't think that, that uh, many of the residents would be very happy with hearing trucks and and uh, mining going on in the middle of the night and dynamite exploding and whatnot. So, you know, so our, and one of the residents asked that, is there a um, an, an ordinance for 24-7? And, you know, we don't have to grant them variances and we don't have to put in a traffic light. There's nothing that says we have to do that. If PennDOT wants to put one in, maybe maybe they override, but um, we don't have to agree to that. So I I just am just saying let's stick to let's let's at least start with sticking with the letter of law of the of the ordinances and I'm using the wrong wording, very you know not allowing variances and sticking with the zoning laws that we have, um, and also not caving into a lawyer. Uh, who's representing them and saying, well, geez, we don't want any delays here. You know, it's like, well, tough luck, Charlie. You know, it's like, we got to do due process here. And you guys all said, every single one of you guys said that we need to look into this traffic study. We need to hear from PennDOT. I heard, I heard you guys saying that. And we don't need to cave into a lawyer to say just because they want to move this along. Yeah. They want to make money. So anyways, uh, this, that, that's all I'm saying is that let's stick with some of the let's let's just remember the, the two and a half minutes. Okay. Well, I got my points in. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stephen Kratz. Uh, Amy and Steve Kratz, thirty-two seventy Meeting House Road. Um, we have a question for the township about the Veris uh, Partners plan. So according to the Veris Partners plan, when the Telford Borough Authority water main is extended from State Road along the frontage of our property on Meeting House Road and a second fire hydrant is installed at that north entrance, will we be required to hook up to public water and sewer? I don't have that answer. Steve or Greg might be able to help you out, but this is actually public comment time. It's not question time. <laughs> um, you wouldn't be allowed to ask that question at a board supervisory meeting. They wouldn't answer it. But uh, do we have, Steve or Greg, do you have any input on that? My initial thought is that the, the, the township doesn't have a mandatory connection ordinance. Um, I don't know what Telford's intents are. In their service area and the health department can make a mandatory connection for sewer if your septic system's failing no it's it's in perfectly good condition it's it's fine and you know our well is in good shape as well everything is working fine that's where i'd rather not spend gobs and gobs of money if not necessary for our sake we take care of our business so i think yeah the health department can require it if something's failing. right not well, not, that's a fair point but we're, we're good and can a, I think, can a requirement to hook up to public water and sewer um, be asked of the property owner uh, if and when they were to sell their property in the right, future? Right. Uh, Steve, in, in regards to their comment, I think they're I think they're uh, referring to public water um, to hook up to that, not sanitary. Yeah. It, Again, all I can say at this time is the, the township doesn't have mandatory connection ordinance. I, I don't know that Telford could could mandate that on their own. Uh, I believe Bucks County does, but I don't know that for sure. And again, if something's Not wrong with the well, they can mandate. There's, there's nothing yeah. wrong. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Chris Link. All right. Uh, I think Steve and Amy bring up a great point in that there's a lot of questions that I don't think the township always considers. Um, so I, th- I think that's something that, that we as a group should probably try to decipher and try to figure out. Um, I lost my other train of thought and I apologize for that, but I'll raise my hand if I remember it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Can I just interject that um, one of the comments was made that you couldn't ask that question at the West Rock Hill uh, You could ask meeting. it, you wouldn't get an answer. <laughs> no, that's not true. You can make a confirmed appointment. You have to make a confirmed appointment. Yes, yes. Right. And so I would like to suggest if that if they really want the answer to that, that would be a good way to go about it. Yes. You can always you can always call me during the day too. I'd be happy to answer stuff during working hours. Yeah, I was just say just contact Greg. He knows everything. <laughs> just contact me during the day. I'll answer your questions during the day. And Greg is even nice to me. So with these questions, why did why did I raise my hand? Else? Why did I raise my hand? Ordinances in Quaker Town and uh, Chris Link, did you remember what you wanted to ask? Your your own mic. Oh, I apologize. No, I I'm complete mental senior moment. Sorry. Yeah. All right, nice. Uh, Patrick DeSantis. Awesome. I just wanted to finish my comment from a little earlier. Um, I'm just not convinced that their retaining ponds are going to retain their water on their property. Um, even if their sprinkler systems start kicking on and putting it back out on their property, it's going to somehow accumulate itself where back into their storage ponds. And then we're, you know, I'm imagining we're getting, the, you know, on the worst storms, you know, like these hurricanes we've been having. They want to make these pipes bigger. If things start going bananas, they're going to let the gates open and I'm going to get crushed. And uh, that's why they want to make those pipes bigger. And, uh, you know, they want to dump these things at the top of my hills and just wash my whole hill out. I mean, uh, you know, nobody's asking me permission and there's already laws in place to prevent them from dumping any more water than what's naturally created. So I'd like to know what studies they've actually done to uh, see what what is natural there in a heavy storm. And we can go off of the last two years, big storms that we've had, because those are perfect testaments, three perfect examples, huge storms. And uh, they want to, you know, literally be inconsiderate. I don't think I think we should we should all be aware that we're all making conscious decisions right now. And um, they are not going to be the only ones responsible for making these decisions. You guys are, too. So, you know, thinking forward, you know, we should think together that, like, if in normal circumstances, I can't dump any of my water on my neighbor's property or you guys are going to have a ruckus about it you know, and make me change it, you know, why are we not doing that preemptively with what we're dealing with? They're trying to build on a wetland, guys. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, it's just common sense here in some of this. That's all. That's all I have to say. All right, thank you. Uh, Jackie Willard. Yes, Jack Willard again. Uh, this is uh, in regards to what Mr. Uh, I, and I hope I get your name right, Mr. Swearaduck. Um, yes. uh, what he had said um, about the zoning and uh, the ordinances within the uh, and permitted uses, uh, we are surrounded by businesses. Um, right down the street, we have uh, BKG. We had drum construction with M and M Stone straight across the street. Nobody ran twenty four seven. That, I believe, is the biggest objection. Um, did we ever believe that that property would not be developed? No. I mean, that, that's, it was a business. We expected it to become a business again. We, nobody, nobody in this area ever expected anything to go 24-7. As a matter of fact, uh, if someone could comment on how many businesses other than the township, uh, other than the hospital, are 24-7 in the township, uh, I'd, I'd appreciate to hear it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Cliff, you still got your hand up? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I just forgot to take it down. Okay. Um, you also have Tony. Tony would like to make a public comment. Okay. Um, Mr. Sirsheim, thank you. I have a comment um, that 
and I'll bring this up tomorrow at the um, Board of Supervisors meeting, but um, I'd like to get, I'd like to have in-person meeting um, because he, he, here's the situation. We have this warehouse here. We got the warehouse um, at Quarry Road. We have this um, storage locker place or frozen storage at um, uh, Cat Hill Road, the Wawa. And then we have another um, facility on the other side of Quarry Road um, that is already in the works. So we have multiple buildings here that's going to come to play here. And for one thing is, is that there's a lot of people that don't do the computer thing and want to be part of the meetings. I don't know why, and I'll bring this up tomorrow night. I don't know why we're the only township that that, that does Zoom. They're all back in person. And you know what? A lot of those people, the elderly from, um, I can't think of the place uh, up on State Road, they can't log in. And it's a shame because if a lot of those people knew what was going on, they'd have something to say too, because this is their community too. And this isn't, you know, me speaking on the planning commission, whatever, it's just in general is like, we got to go back to in-person meetings. I think it's wrong. I think that we need to bring people together. There's a lot of people tonight. I mean, look, look, there was 32 people here tonight and they're all concerned. Like we have to think out, you know, we got to go to in-person meeting. This is the only township that has not done that. Sellersville does, Harleysville does, go down south, they do. And it's, you, there's a lot of people that can't log on. We're, we're in a rural community that those people can't log Two and on. and a half minutes are up. So I think that we need to um, explore that and I'll bring that up tomorrow night. And I think that has to be considered. All right. Thanks, Tony. Anyone else, Greg? I have one email comment. Okay. Uh, Josh Landis of 24 Bardsley Road. I appreciate you recording and getting the answers for our neighborhood questions. I request to know how much exhaust and emissions will be generated by the proposed Meeting House Road Warehouse Truck Depot, both on day one and also when the facility is 100% occupied and utilized and all associated truck traffic it will bring. Specifically, how will it, how will the increased truck traffic affect ground level ozone, uh, particulate matter 2.5, carbon monoxide, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, and any other harmful airborne pollutants? Please indicate how they are guaranteeing that our community will not be exposed to pollution in excess of the U.S. national ambient air quality standards as required by federal law. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Seeing and hearing no one else, uh, I would look for a motion to adjourn. John, I'll make the motion. Tim, I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Been a long one. Appreciate uh, everybody's help. Have a good night. Thanks. Have a good evening. Good night. Thank good you night, very everybody. much. Good night.